Good morning. My name is Peggy Hasenauer. I am the executive director of the Kovler Diabetes Center. We're um, just honored and thrilled to have you here today. Uh, this is a, a continuing medical education conference, um, so we can all learn more about monogenic diabetes. Uh, those who are participating will be receiving continuing med medical education credits. Uh, and now, without further ado, I'd love to introduce our first um, speaker, if you will. He'll be making introductory remarks this morning. Um, Dr. Lou Phillipson is the director of the Kovler Diabetes Center and the James C. Tyree Professor of uh, Care and Research in the Departments of Medicine and Pediatrics here at the University of Chicago. Uh, he is a former president of medicine and science at the American Diabetes Association, where he served in 2019 until 2020. Uh, he is the recipient of the Banting Medal uh, for uh, his service is part of the 79th Annual Scientific Sessions in 2019. Uh, he is really a pioneer, as is Dr. Bell and many of those you'll hear speaking um, today and over the next couple of days with regard to genetics and diabetes. Uh, we are just thrilled and honored to have Dr. Phillipson and the entire team here today to share with you more about our insights uh, from research to care. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Lou Phillipson for our opening remarks. Thank you, Peggy. Just greetings to everyone. Just a, a quick couple of things to say. I want to welcome everyone. We have a nice group of attendees as well as a spectacular group of panelists. I wanted to particularly thank Dr. Urano for, for joining us uh, from um, WashU, who will talk about um, Wolfram, and we're looking forward to that. Uh, our other wonderful speakers you'll hear introduced in turn and we'll have a break at 11. I do wanna emphasize that we're here to answer questions. I mean, part of this is uh, to be sure you uh, get your questions answered. Many of the folks who have participated in the past have cases that, that are patients, subjects, friends, sometimes themselves, that have been referred to us for further uh, study analysis suggestions. We are always open 24 seven to hear about them. For, for today, please put your questions in the um, in the Q&A box, if you like. There's also a chat box where the Q&A will come up for questions answered. You can always email us. We have our website, which will be re referred to multiple times so that you can use that um, to uh, give to other colleagues or people with potential unusual forms of diabetes, and we will get back to you. We have several uh, support mechanisms to do that. And so I wanted to, at the outset, acknowledge um, NIDDK for their support, past support from the American Diabetes Association, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, the Helmsley Trust, our own um, uh, patients and supporters and philanthropists. And so with that, it's uh, time now to turn it back to Peggy and she'll introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Dr. Phillipson. Uh, I'd like to introduce Lisa Letourneau uh, as our first speaker today. Lisa Letourneau is amazing. She has been with the University of Chicago Kovler Diabetes Center and a monogenic diabetes program for more than seven years. Uh, she came to us from UNC Chapel Hill, uh, where she is a, a trained dietitian, uh, but uh, did some really important research uh, in uh, genetics and diabetes and nutrition uh, when she obtained her master's in public health. Um, Lisa has just recently been promoted as uh, Kobler's Director of Research Programs. Uh, we are just thrilled and honored to have her today um, to talk to us and, and really give us an overview uh, and strategies to diagnose monogenic diabetes. Uh, Lisa, uh, while not specifically a, a faculty member, uh, has a multi-center experience in um, diagnosing and discussing uh, diagnoses with providers as well as patients. Thank you, Lisa, take it away. Thank you so much, Peggy, for that very kind introduction. And um, good morning, everyone. I'm so pleased to be presenting today um, an overview of monogenic diabetes, as well as some strategies to identify these patients. So we will dive right in. I don't have any disclosures to share today. And uh, I really value case-based learning. So we're going to refer back to this case throughout the session today as we learn a little bit more about monogenic diabetes. So to get us all familiar, this is um, John. This is a 38-year-old non-Hispanic white female um, 
He was diagnosed at age 25. This was an incidental finding at a sports physical. Um, his fasting blood sugar at that time was 124 milligrams per deciliter. So just in the pre-diabetes range um, and his A1C was 5.6%. He had a BMI that was in the normal range, 23 kilograms per meter squared, and he was antibody negative. Um, he had a follow-up OGTT done, his fasting blood sugar in the OGTT was 128 milligrams per deciliter, two hours was 190, um, and he was started on insulin. So he, at the time that we met him, um, was using an insulin pump 20 units a day, which is about 0.26 units per kilo, and his A1C had been very stable um, kind of staying between 5.6 to 6.2% since his diagnosis. And you can see on the right in our pedigree, the arrow is pointing to John. Um, he did have a sister with diabetes as well as a, a father with diabetes. So we'll come back to John throughout this presentation. So to start with just kind of an introduction to monogenic diabetes, um, as a uh, those on the call know there are many different kinds of diabetes. Um, and so here at the University of Chicago, we like to think about diabetes through a genetic lens. And we do that by breaking the types of diabetes up into kind of two main groups, monogenic diabetes, which of course is our focus for today, and then polygenic forms of diabetes. So um, to break that down a little bit further, monogenic just meaning that there's a single genetic change or abnormality that is by itself sufficient to cause hyperglycemia. Whereas the polygenic types of diabetes, you might have multiple genetic variants that are not on their own um, strong enough to cause hyperglycemia, but together they can confer an increased risk for developing polygenic conditions like the more common forms of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. So I'll discuss more of the details of monogenic diabetes in a few minutes, but again, from a big picture perspective, I think the main take home here is just that it's really important to know that monogenic diabetes is different than type one and type two. And identifying people that have monogenic diabetes is really important. It truly can change lives. Um, having this accurate diagnosis is essential for a couple different reasons. One, it can help us create an accurate diabetes treatment plan. So for example, if we know that a person has true autoimmune type one diabetes, we know that they're generally going to require lifelong insulin therapy. Whereas if we know that someone has a type of monogenic diabetes, such as HNF1 alpha Modi, we can tailor their treatment to something that's more specific for that type of diabetes, such as using an oral medication, sulfonylureas. It can also help us with having um, addi uh, accurate additional testing so again, for example, if we have a patient who has true autoimmune type one diabetes, we know that they would be at increased risk for other autoimmune conditions like autoimmune thyroid conditions and celiac disease. And so it would be important to check for those conditions. Um, whereas if we know that someone has, again, HNF1 alpha Modi, they do not have an increased risk for those other autoimmune conditions. And so we would not need to check for those. Um, and that would hopefully reduce uh, kind of care burden and medical costs. It also can help us provide an accurate information to our patients on recurrence risk or heritability. So we know that um, if a parent has type one diabetes, the chance of their child having type one, somewhere between one to 6%, kind of depending on a few different factors. Um, whereas for example, if we know that someone has one of the autosomal dominant forms of monogenic diabetes, they would have a 50% chance of passing that on to their children. And I think maybe most importantly, in some ways, knowing what type of diabetes someone has um, can really help us uh, get to this really important question that our patients often ask us, which is why me? Why did I get diabetes? Um, and knowing the answer to that can be really powerful. So I wanted to take a quick moment to give a special shout out to any diabetes care and education specialists that may be joining us today. Um, in addition to endocrinologists, Diabetes care and education specialists are some of the top referring uh, folks for sending people to our studies and, and to um, asking questions about monogenic diabetes. So um, they play a really important role in the diabetes care team. They often spend a little bit um, longer with patients with diabetes in clinic. So they might have the opportunity to have, you know, um, an hour long session with someone. And so this can give them a really unique opportunity to learn more and kind of dive deeper into some of the clinical features that we'll be talking about in the next few slides. So I just wanted to continue to encourage our diabetes care and education specialists to keep monogenic diabetes at the forefront of your mind, um, develop those deep relationships with patients, uh, be able to ask some of these detailed questions that we're gonna talk about, like getting into family history and things like that. 
So the ADA and the EASD uh, recently launched the Precision Medicine in Diabetes Initiative. And I'd encourage you, if you haven't already, to follow some of the links on this slide to learn more about that. But in brief, um, you can see the mandate is listed here on the slide to establish consensus on the viability and potential implementation of precision medicine for the diagnosis, prognosis, prevention, and treatment of diabetes. Um, and this group has also acknowledged that monogenic diabetes is uh, is really doing that right now. Monogenic diabetes is precision medicine in diabetes in practice. So um, this uh, link that I have here to this article is really great, and I would encourage you to read it to learn more about that initiative. All right, so we're going to dive a little deeper into monogenic diabetes. I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, monogenic diabetes, you know, kind of by definition is hyperglycemia that's caused by a single genetic abnormality. And monogenic diabetes is an umbrella term. So that just means that there are uh, three kind of primary subtypes of monogenic diabetes. There's MODI, which stands for maturity onset diabetes of the young. There's neonatal diabetes, and there are syndromic forms. And um, we're fortunate enough today to have speakers that will go into all of those in more detail later in this um, education event. We often get asked how common monogenic diabetes is. So although it's considered a relatively rare condition, it still affects about two to 5% of all people with diabetes diagnosed less than roughly age 35. So this um, amounts to a lot of people that have this condition and many of them do not know that they have it. They're um, misdiagnosed or undiagnosed. And the only way to know if someone has monogenic diabetes is to do genetic testing, but there are clinical features, which we'll talk about next, that can help us figure out who might need that testing. So um, for the purposes of today's presentation, I'm gonna focus on individual level identification like we would do in clinic. I just wanted to note that there are lots of interesting studies out there that have worked on broader level identification of patients with monogenic diabetes or other atypical types of diabetes, such as using um, electronic health record-based approaches, um, but I didn't have time to go into that today. So to start, um, I think it's easiest to start with diagnosis age. So if you have a patient in front of you in clinic, um, make sure you know when they were diagnosed with, with diabetes or with hyperglycemia. If they were diagnosed less than about 12 months of age, they should have genetic testing. Um, so it can be helpful to look at things like antibody status as well, but in general, um, we do recommend testing for anyone diagnosed less than about 12 months of age. So that one's pretty straightforward, pretty easy. Um, it's really important, I guess I'll just add to make sure that we do ask about diagnosis age. So sometimes I'll have people say, well, Lisa, I'm an adult endocrinologist. I'm never going to see someone with neonatal diabetes. Um, but of course we know that kids grow up, um, for the most part and turn into adults. So even as a adult care provider, you still might find the rare person that was diagnosed less than a year of age. So for those that were diagnosed between one to 35 years of age or so, it can be um, a little bit more complicated. So we'll talk more about those features on the next slide. For people that were diagnosed after 35, this isn't a, a specific cutoff. So um, it's less likely to find monogenic diabetes at that age, but still totally possible, especially for people that have GCK MODI. And we'll talk about that again more in, a, in the next slide here. So for people that were diagnosed between age one to 35, and then again, those rare occasions after age 35, we're basically trying to figure out if they don't fit within typical type one or typical type two diabetes. Um, and so for not fitting within typical type one, this would mean things like they're negative for diabetes autoantibodies. They have unusually low insulin requirements three or more years out from their diabetes diagnosis. This could be supported by um, evidence of lower endogenous, uh, uh, evidence of endogenous insulin production, such as a positive C-peptide. Um, or just using less insulin than we would expect for their age and their diabetes duration. We look for um, two or more linear generations of family members with a similar type of diabetes that were also diagnosed less than approximately 35 years old. And there is um, a great resource from our friends at the University of Exeter, the Modi Probability Calculator, which I've linked here. Um, and you can use this as well. It asks for some basic information um, about the patient, uh, no PHI, and um, you can get a probability score. I will note, importantly, there are limitations to this calculator, so it should um, be used in conjunction with um, clinical judgment. So for someone that doesn't fit within typical type two diabetes, we're looking for features like not having evidence of metabolic syndrome, um, having a non-obese BMI, although I wanted to just make an important point here that 
um, having an obese BMI does not rule out the possibility of monogenic diabetes. We've certainly seen many cases of folks that have an obese BMI that do have monogenic diabetes. So this is just one piece of the whole picture. Again, the strong linear family history of family members with the same kind of diabetes diagnosed less than age 35 or so, and the probability calculator can be helpful here as well. So GCK MODI is kind of its own thing, and it has a very classic phenotype that can be um, uh, pretty easy to identify once you um, know what the features are. So for GCK MODI, we're looking for mild, uh, mildly elevated, stable fasting hyperglycemia. So fasting blood sugar is somewhere in the range of 100 to 140 milligrams per deciliter, um, A1C somewhere between 5.6 to 7.6% in participants of any age. So it's important to know here that um, this is a lifelong stable fasting hyperglycemia. Um, and these, are, these cases are often first identified when a person first comes to medical attention for some other reason. So for example, for children at like a sports physical or adults at a routine annual physical, um, and then especially for um, people who are pregnant at their first pregnancy. Um, so if, as I mentioned before, this stable, mildly elevated fasting hyperglycemia is present from birth. So if people have fasting blood sugars that are less than 100 milligrams per deciliter or so, um, or A1Cs that are less than 5.6% consistently, that would really argue against GCK MODI. And then lastly, I'll just quickly mention some sym syndromic features of interest. So these are things that we don't see quite as often, but are really um, important and can be easy to pick out. So we're interested in features like a strong family history of diabetes and kidney disease, abnormally shaped kidneys, abnormally shaped areas of the genitourinary tract, um, diabetes and liver adenomas, patients that are born with a small or totally absent pancreas, um, and then a um, kind of special condition of mitochondrial encephalomyelitis myopathy, um, MILAS or MID, uh, you can see those here. So we think about, um, you know, deafness, stroke-like episodes, things like that, that might point us towards a possibility of mitochondrial diabetes. So I also wanted to make um, a really important, important point here on this slide, which is that people of all races and ethnicities have monogenic diabetes. Um, our team was fortunate enough to be involved uh, a few years ago with the ADA standards of care section that focused on diagnosing monogenic diabetes. And um, there was a statement in the uh, 2016 version of that document that erroneously said that um, only people of a low risk ethnic group should be tested for monogenic diabetes. And that's not the case. Um, we know that monogenic diabetes can occur in all races and ethnicities. And so race and ethnicity should not be a factor in determining whether you test someone for monogenic diabetes. Um, this should be something that you consider for every patient that walks in your clinic. So in summary, um, I won't read through this in detail, but please make sure that you have the following information on every patient. These are just kind of a summary of the clinical features that we look for that can help us determine if someone has monogenic diabetes. Um, and you're welcome to uh, take a screenshot of this or you can find it in the recording as well. So in our research studies at the University of Chicago, we're really fortunate to have funding from um, the NIDDK, as Dr. Phillipson mentioned. This allows us to perform free research-based testing for um, certain participants who qualify for that study who are not able to obtain clinical genetic testing. So it can be a great resource for those that are underinsured or uninsured. Um, and so we wanted to understand kind of how genetic testing patterns are, are going. And so we looked at our registry participants um, and we classified them into two groups, those that were able to obtain clinical genetic testing versus those that were not able to obtain clinical genetic testing. And so we had to test them on a research basis through our studies. So the good news is that more clinical testing is happening. So in the last six years, we had less registry participants that needed us to provide research-based testing compared to the six years prior to that. So um, currently we're only you know, providing testing, research-based testing for about 50% of our participants, which is an improvement from um, a rate of more like 70% previously. The downside is that um, it's still taking a long time for people to be diagnosed with monogenic diabetes. And so again, I applaud all of you for coming to this continuing education um, event today. This is really one of the goals, of course, of having events like this to make sure that providers are aware of this diagnosis. 
Um, so unfortunately, the average time from initial diagnosis of diabetes to the correct genetic diagnosis for people in our registry was over 12 years. So over a decade of having an incorrect diagnosis and potentially incorrect treatment. So a little bit more about our registry. Um, the registry has been going on for over a decade and um, we have over 4,000 participants enrolled as of today. Um, we have over 1,100 with a known cause. You can see kind of the breakdown here. And um, I have our website and our email address listed. Uh, I just wanna thank everyone who's on this call who has um, referred patients to us in the past or if um, any of you might be participants yourselves, we really wouldn't know much about monogenic diabetes without all of your participation. And so it's, it's much appreciated by our team. Our team does a lot more um, than, than just run the registry. And um, I've listed some of those uh, additional kind of resources and services for you here. So we're very happy to be a resource for clinicians or patients. Um, we are most accessible by email. So again, you can send us an email to the email on the previous slide. We um, are happy to think about, you know, with you uh, kind of gene specific phenotyping. So um, we'll often have providers send us like a de-identified case summary of a patient of interest and we can kind of talk through together, you know, what, which type of monogenic diabetes seems most likely. Um, as I mentioned before, we do provide access to free research-based genetic testing for patients who otherwise can't obtain clinical genetic testing. Um, these days we do a lot of genetic testing report interpretation. So um, genetic testing, again, is a key part of monogenic diabetes to know if someone has that condition, um, but the reports can be full of jargon, um, they can be pretty confusing. And so one of the resources that we are happy to offer is kind of helping interpret those results and whether the variant that's identified is actually disease causing or not. Um, our doctors on the group, um, many of whom you'll hear from later today are happy to you know, um, give general guidance on pharmacotherapy, um, kind of standards for uh, best agents to use for various forms of monogenic diabetes. There are opportunities for participants, of course, to take part in um, prospective clinical outcome studies. This includes our registry, as well as some other kind of additional ancillary studies. We do things like um, sleep tracking, CGM wearing, things like that. We also do offer um, virtual visits for patients who might be interested in that and have um, you know, the appropriate um, insurance coverage and, and kind of depending on where they live, things like that. All right, so we're going to go back to thinking about John, our case that I introduced earlier, and um, I would encourage you to think about whether he has any of these clinical features of interest that we discussed. So uh, I've outlined them here, but uh, briefly, he was diagnosed under age 35. He has a normal BMI. He was antibody negative. Um, his blood sugars have been uh, relatively stable, mild uh, fasting hyperglycemia. So he's ha he has fasting blood sugars you know, in that 100 to 140 milligrams per deciliter range. Um, he's using less insulin than we might expect for someone of his age and, and um, diabetes duration if he had something like, for example, type one diabetes. And again, he's had that really stable A1C. Um, he does have a two generation family history that we know of, of a similar type of hyperglycemia. So what would we do in clinic? Um, well, the next step definitely would be that we need to get genetic testing for John. Um, we think he has monogenic diabetes. Now he needs genetic testing. Um, we wanna make sure that we take that next step and confirm whether he actually has this and if, if so, what type. Um, and uh, Dr. Daniela Del Guardio will cover genetic testing uh, details a lot further in her session later today. So I won't linger on this too long. Um, but if you're a provider that can order this type of testing, you should um, call the insurer or the patient can call the insurer to see if this type of testing would be covered. Some things we think about are whether the insurance company has a preferred or a contracted lab that you would have to use. Um, and then they might ask you for something like a prior authorization letter or a letter of support. Um, we do have template letters for that. So if you shoot us an email, we're happy to provide you with a letter template that you can use to provide to the insurance company. Um, if we have any providers on this call who are not able to order this type of testing on their own, I would really encourage you to um, work on advocating. So um, connect with an ordering provider in your group and talk through why you think this person has monogenic diabetes and um, make sure that you're advocating for them to get that testing. And again, if your patient is uninsured or their insurance won't cover the cost of testing, we're happy to discuss whether they would qualify for a research-based genetic testing um, and the either the patient themselves, um, or you could email us at monogenicdiabetes at uchicago.edu. So um, 
So um, hopefully you've made a, a guess in your head about what type of monogenic diabetes John might have. And um, we were able to perform research-based genetic testing for John. Um, turns out he has a pathogenic, a likely pathogenic variant in the GCK gene. Um, so this is GCK Modi, and Dr. Naylor will be talking about GCK Modi a lot further in her session later today. Um, importantly, we were also able to test John's family members, and um, they also had GCK Modi. So just another great example of how if you find one person within a family with this condition, you're often finding several others as well. So I wanted to take just a minute to talk about a new resource. So what if we really thought John had monogenic diabetes and we got genetic testing, but it was negative, what would we have done then? So um, there are new resources available for people who you think have monogenic diabetes or atypical diabetes, but are negative for monogenic diabetes testing. Um, and that's a new study called RADIANT. It stands for Rare and Atypical Diabetes Network. Um, this is a multi-center national study that's supported by NIDDK. And you can see in the map on the left, all the different participating centers. Um, there's a study flyer here on the right. We do have study materials available in both English and Spanish. So we would welcome any Spanish speaking participants as well. Um, and really the um, inclusion criteria for Radiant, as I mentioned, is that we're looking for people that have atypical diabetes and don't have monogenic diabetes. So it doesn't look like type one, it doesn't look like type two, it's not monogenic, then what is it? That's really the goal of Radiant, trying to discover new forms of atypical diabetes. So I've listed some um, in, important inclusion and exclusion criteria here. Um, one thing to just keep in mind is that patients do have to have met a diagnosis, um, uh, lab results that are kind of diagnostic for diabetes at least some point in the past. So we would be looking for you know, fasting blood sugar, two hour postprandial numbers or A1Cs that have met the cutoff for diabetes. Pregnant women are not able to participate in the study. So um, just real quick in the last few minutes here, the structure of Radiant is that it's in three stages. Um, so stage one is that can be done completely online. Um, there, it does involve blood collection. That would need to be done at a local Quest Diagnostic Center, or they could come to one of our Radiant centers across the US. We have an adjudication committee that reviews cases and determines if they can move on to stage two, which is where whole genome sequencing occurs. So um, we're really excited to be able to offer this you know, most comprehensive type of genetic testing in Radiant. And then if, they, uh, if the participant advances all the way to stage three, we do have them come in for a really thorough visit with our team, including things like a physical exam and other standard phenotyping tests. The study is open to all ages, um, from infants all the way to older adults. And we may ask family members to participate as well, depending on the situation. So if you have patients that might be interested in this, feel free to refer them to the website, atypicaldiabetesnetwork.org. So in summary, I would encourage everyone on the call today to consider for every patient that you see in your clinic, do I have the right diagnosis for this person? What evidence do I have to support that diagnosis? Are they on the right therapy for that personalized diagnosis? Um, patients with undiagnosed monogenic diabetes are in our clinics. We know that just based on the prevalence numbers. And um, it's really important to go over those clinical features of interest with your patient. So making sure you know what age they were diagnosed, what their family history is. And if you identify a patient that has those interesting clinical features, please take the next step and help them get genetic testing. We are always happy to help um, whenever you might need it. You can reach out to us again at monogenicdiabetes at uchicago.edu. And if you have a patient who you think does not have type one, type two, or monogenic diabetes, then please consider other resources like Radiant. And that's all I have for today. So I think I'm done um, at time. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Peggy. Hi, thank you so much, Lisa. We truly appreciate your presentation. Uh, we are at time and we are going to introduce our next speaker, but for those of you who have questions, please put them in the Q&A and we would uh, very much like to answer your questions. Uh, Lisa is more than happy to answer your questions. Other physicians and participants today may also wanna hop in uh, and answer some of these questions on the Q&A. So please go ahead and ask Lisa those questions. Um, We'll move forward uh, with our next speaker. Um, Dr. Urano uh, is an MD, PhD, and he is the Samuel um, Schechter Professor of Medicine um, of Pathology and Immunology at the University of Chicago. We're just thrilled and honored to have um, him here today. Um, 
he has clinical training in pathology, oncology, and medical genetics. Um, he studied endoplasmic reticulum biology um, at NYU Medical School uh, under the mentorship of uh, David Ron, uh, who is currently a professor at the University of Cambridge. Um, he has clinical expertise in genetic testing and counseling of patients with monogenic diabetes, uh, syndromic diabetes, uh, retinal dystrophy, and other diseases related to endoplasmic reticulum dysfunction. Um, his research expertise is also in Wolfram syndrome and um, other endoplasmic reticulum diseases. Uh, he's certainly a driving force in Wolfram syndrome research, Wolfram spectrum disorder, and other related diseases. Um, these are genetic diseases, as many of you know, that are caused by uh, insulin-dependent diabetes, retinal dystrophy, hearing impairment. Um, these are things that can be caused by this syndrome. Um, so Dr. Urano is um, here today to talk to us about his work, and uh, we're just thrilled and honored to have him here. Uh, please take it away, Dr. Urano. Thank you, uh, Ms. Hazenawa, for your very kind introduction. And I'd like to thank Dr. Philipson and uh, you know Lisa Lutterno and all the uh, team members at the University of Chicago for uh, giving me to, uh, to share our research study results on Wolfram syndrome. So today I am going to talk about a monogenic diabetes, a type of monogenic diabetes, uh, Wolfram syndrome. So here is my disclosure. And uh, so uh, here is my research team and also all the collaborators uh, at Washington University, as well as at different uh, institutions. So this is clearly a teamwork. So let's start from uh, this case of a patient with uh, juvenile onset diabetes. So this patient was diagnosed with type one diabetes when she was uh, uh, she was four years old and she was antibody negative. She was white female and uh, sh her parents did not have diabetes and she had no family history of diabetes. And at age five, patient was developed color blindness. And then uh, she saw a, a, a neuro ophthalmologist and she was diagnosed with optic nerve atrophy, not retinopathy. And at age six, patient was diagnosed with diabetes insipidus. And at age 10, patient was diagnosed with neurogenic bladder. And she was actually a patient at the Ascentris Children's Hospital, which is affiliated with Washington University. And then genetic testing on a single gene called WFS1 was performed. And genetic testing identified two pathogenic variants in the WFS1 gene. So this she was actually diagnosed with Wolfram syndrome. So what is Wolfram syndrome? So Wolfram syndrome is the, uh, um, characterized by juvenile onset diabetes. And most patients are insulin dependent, but some patients are managed with the GLP-1 receptor agonists or metformin only. And the patients develop optic nerve atrophy around age 10. So the onset of diabetes is around age six, usually. Then I think 60% of patients develop deafness. And many of our patients wear hearing aids. And some patients have cochlear implants. And major issues of these patients is neurodegeneration. And so they, they develop uh, brainstem atrophy and cerebellar, cerebellar atrophy. So many patients have ataxia and the brainstem atrophy can lead to the, uh, the, the difficulty in swallowing and breathing. So many patients die due to the aspiration pneumonia or central sleep apnea. So this is a terrible disease. And most patients have pathogenic variants in the WFS1 gene. So this is a syndromic monogenic diabetes. And the causative gene for this syndrome was discovered by Dr. Alan, a late Dr. Alan Paramat at Washington University in 1998 and named WFS1. 
Waterfram syndrome one. And the gene was identified by positional uh, linkage study. So uh, Lisa actually just introduced the uh, monogenic diabetes. So most monogenic forms of diabetes are inherited by the uh, autosomal dominant manner. But Wolfram syndrome is different. Wolfram syndrome is an autosomal recessive uh, monogenic form of diabetes. So that means uh, parents, so as you know, we all have two copies of WFS1 gene, one from dad, one from mom. And so patients with Wolfram syndrome, they have two uh, mutated copies. And usually parents have, both parents have one mutated copy. Then both parents gave their child their uh, mutated copy copies. So then this is an autosomal recessive disease. And Wolfram syndrome is a rare disease and the prevalence seems to be one in 500,000, but it seems like the prevalence is much higher uh, based on our recent studies. We also realized different types of, uh, we also realized patients with diabetes or different medical conditions who carried only one pathogenic variant in the WFS1 gene. So I, I just introduced Wolfram as an autosomal recessive disorder. So patients who carry two mutated copies in the WFS1 gene, they develop Wolfram syndrome characterized by diabetes mellitus, diabetes insipidus, optic nerve atrophy, healing loss, and neurodegeneration. And we identified some patients who have developed diabetes just by having one mutated copy in the WFS1 gene. So these patients develop only diabetes. So they have WFS1 modi. And we also identified a group of patients who uh, develop neonatal diabetes due to having only one mutated copy in the WFS1 gene. So these patients have specific WFS1 variant. And these patients have development in addition to neonatal diabetes, they have developmental delay, intellectual disability, hypotonia, sensory neural deafness, congenital cataracts, glaucoma. But today, but these are really, really rare uh, conditions. So uh, conditions. And so today I'm gonna focus on Wolfram syndrome, which is the syndromic monogenic diabetes. So we have been studying Wolfram syndrome in the past 20, almost 20 years. And WFS1 gene, causative gene for Wolfram syndrome uh, encodes transmembrane protein localized to the endoplasmic reticulum. So what is endoplasmic reticulum? So endoplasmic reticulum is a cellular compartment executing multiple uh, vital uh, cellular functions, including protein folding of the newly synthesized proteins and important for calcium storage. And so Wolfram gene encodes transmembrane protein localized to the endoplasmic reticulum and Wolfram gene is important for endoplasmic reticulum calcium homeostasis, as well as the homeostasis in the endoplasmic reticulum. And it has been known that disruption of in endoplasmic reticulum homeostasis, especially uh, the imbalance between the folding capacity in the endoplasmic reticulum and the uh, protein load to the endoplasmic reticulum cause a type of cell stress called endoplasmic reticulum stress. And the loss of function of Wolfram gene causes endoplasmic reticulum dysfunction and stress because Wolfram gene is important for uh, regulating endoplasmic reticulum stress levels and also uh, regulation of the uh, uh, cellular calcium, endoplasmic reticulum calcium homeostasis. So now we know that Wolfram syndrome is a prototype endoplasmic reticulum disorder. 
I also want to emphasize that many patients with Wolfram are misdiagnosed with type 1 diabetes because they all develop uh, diabetes mellitus first. That, that's usually the first manifestation in patients with Wolfram. But because of the very hard work of you know, doctors and researchers at uh, University of Chicago, now many patients, many pediatric patients who have uh, who do not have autoantibodies, they are sequenced on monogenic diabetes genes. And now we now we have many patients who have been diagnosed with Wolfram early. So that's really, uh, that's really a good thing. So it's important to uh, sequence uh, some patients with uh, mon uh, pediatric diabetes uh, for uh, sequencing. Okay, so what is WFS1 gene? So this has, so we have identified, so this is a summary of our research studies in the past 20 years in one slide. So Wolfram gene, is important for negative regulation of the endoplasmic reticulum stress response. And it's also important for maintaining high levels of endoplasmic reticulum calcium. So loss of function of the WFS1 gene causes high levels of endoplasmic reticulum stress, as well as some mitochondrial dysfunction, because there is a connection between endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria and also loss of function of WFS1 gene causes low levels of endoplasmic reticulum calcium and high levels of cytoplasmic calcium, which can eventually lead to cell death. And so at, at Washington University, we have, uh, we have a Wolfram syndrome research program. So this is our website, uh, Wolfram syndrome dot wustl.edu and so our registry is usually uh, the entrance of our clinical uh, studies just like monogenic diabetes registry at the university of chicago so right now i think we have around uh, 250 patients with wolfram in our registry so we have medical records from more than uh, 200 patients and at, at Washington University, uh, Dr. Tami Hashi's group has been running the longitudinal study uh, of uh, patients with Wolfram. So, uh, and also we, uh, we have completed one clinical trial and we are starting a new clinical trial in patients with Wolfram. So if you are interested in our Wolfram study or if your patients are interested in you know any clinical studies please contact our nurse coordinator Stacy Hurst this is her uh, contact information and usually by googling Wolfram syndrome you can get to this website that so you can find the contact information of Stacy who is a fantastic uh, research nurse coordinator okay so this is the very simple so our clearly uh, when I see a patient with Wolfram syndrome in, uh, in my clinic, most patients, actually all the patients ask me, is there any uh, treatment that can stop or re reverse the progression of Wolfram syndrome? And the answer is uh, currently we do not have any proven uh, new treatment that can stop the progression of Wolfram syndrome. So we are working very hard to develop a uh, cutting edge uh, treatment that can stop the progression, or hopefully reverse the progression of Wolfram syndrome. And that's all based on the molecular mechanisms of the Wolfram syndrome. So the root cause of the disease is uh, mutations or pa pathogenic variants in the WFS1 gene that can lead to the downstream consequences these are dysregulated endoplasmic reticulum calcium homeostasis, endoplasmic reticulum stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, and then cell death. And then death of retinal ganglion cells can lead to optic nerve atrophy, and death of insulin-producing cells leads to a diabetes, and death of uh, vasopressin-producing cells in the pituitary gland lead to diabetes insipidus, 
and death of a neuron can lead to neurodegeneration. So we have been trying to target uh, different actually uh, components of the uh, pathogenesis of the Wolfram. So first we try to target this regulated endoplasmic reticulum calcium homeostasis using the existing uh, uh, existing medication. So, so we try to uh, conduct the uh, uh, drug repurposing clinical trial. So we identified dantrolene sodium as a potential treatment for Wolfram syndrome, and we conducted the phase 1b 2a clinical trial of dantrolene sodium in patients with Wolfram syndrome. The results uh, have been published in JCI Insight. And based on these results, we are uh, revising our clinical trial protocol and uh, we may conduct the further study on, uh, on dantrolene sodium in patients with Wolfram syndrome. Also, we are, uh, we are developing new uh, oral medication or medications for patients with Wolfram syndrome. So this is one of our, actually one of, uh, one of our top candidates called AMX0035. This medication was originally developed by a, a biotech company called Amirix in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And this, this molecule targets uh, endoplasmic reticulum stress, mitochondrial dysfunction. Also, it uh, stabilizes uh, some, fo some, form of, some forms of a mutant WFS1 protein. So uh, Amirix uh, originally developed this molecule for the treatment of ALS, and, uh, but this molecule could be uh, a good, actually, uh, molecule for the treatment of Wolfram. So what's AMX0035? This is a combination of two molecules, uh, 4 PBA and Tudica, or taurosodiol. And both molecules have been shown to mitigate, uh, reduce endoplasmic reticulum stress and improves mitochondrial functions. So it's a combination of two molecules. And uh, so we thought, uh, this was the good uh, potential treatment for Wolfram. So a uh, postdoc in my lab, uh, Ria Asada and others worked on this molecule and conducted a preclinical uh, study. So we uh, differentiated uh, induced pluripotent stem cells derived from our patients uh, in, into a neural progenitor cells, brain-like cells. Then we treated uh, these cells with the uh, AMX. And we did a lot of, uh, we looked at different parameters, but in short, this treatment reduces cell death in uh, Wolfram patient IPSC derived neural progenitor cells. So with control, so the Y axis shows the uh, 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 caspase 3 7 activity, which reflects their cell death. And so without treatment, cell death level is like this. It's called vehicle. And the AMX treatment uh, reduces, reduced the cell death levels. PBA and Tuduka, they also reduced uh, cell death levels. And it seems like there is an additive effect. We also looked at the mitochondrial functions, cellular respiration of uh, uh, Wolfram IPSC derived neural progenitor cells treated with AMX, and we could improve uh, my mitochondrial cellular, uh, cellular respiration, which reflects mitochondrial activity uh, using the uh, AMX0035. So we could improve mitochondrial functions. And we also uh, differentiated Wolfram uh, IPSC derived uh, Wolfram patients' IPSCs into uh, uh, insulin-producing cells or pancreatic beta cells in collaboration with Dr. Milman and uh, Dr. Milman's uh, student, Christina Maxwell. Now she graduated, so she has PhD. And so the Wolfram patient iPSC-derived beta cells 
have defects in insulin production and the insulin secretion. So AN1.1 is controlled and W024, W121, these are derived from uh, Wolfram patients. And insulin production in Wolfram, uh, insulin production as well as glucose stimulated insulin secretion in uh, Wolfram patient IPSC derived beta cells are uh, much lower in pair. So we see impaired glucose stimulated insulin secretion. And by treating these beta cells with AMX 0035, we could significantly improve baseline insulin secretion as well as glucose stimulated insulin secretion. So blue is without treatment and pink is with treatment. Y axis shows insulin secretion. We also treated Wolfram mice with AMX and we could improve their uh, diabetes and we got their some borderline results on visual acuity. So these results uh, were sufficient to uh, secure, if, uh, secure the uh, orphan drug designation of AMX. And we are working on the IND and so we are currently modifying a trial protocol based on the feedback from the FDA, but we are pretty close to uh, the finalizing the trial protocol. And we plan to start a trial in this coming October or maybe de December uh, at Washington University Medical Center and the sponsor is Amidix Pharmaceuticals. Okay, so, um, Clearly, uh, in addition to our oral medications, we are developing gene therapy and regenerative therapy for patients with Wolfram because Wolfram is the monogenic disorder. And so we are testing three different approaches, uh, transfer normal WFS1 using adeno-associated virus and correct mutant WFS1 by uh, CRISPR-Cas9 Cas9, we are actually switching to a different type of the gene editing called prime editing. And we are also try, trying to deliver a regenerative gene called MAMF into a, a cell model, IPSC model, and a mouse model of Wolfram syndrome. So the, we have already published the uh, CRISPR Cas9 uh, mediated gene editing. Is uh, is a is a you know, good approach to treat uh, diabetes in Wolfram syndrome. So by correcting mutation in uh, Wolfram syndrome uh, iPSC derived beta cells, we could improve insulin secretion and the insulin production. And so we are trying to replicate this success in brain and eyes. So we have uh, different models to test gene editing or prime editing. We have iPSC derived retinal ganglion cells, and we also have mouse models. And we are also uh, trying to uh, regenerate insulin producing cells and also retinal ganglion cells using a naturally occurring molecule called MAMF. This is a neurotrophic factor and which has interesting uh, uh, features such as reducing endoplasmic reticulum stress and uh, uh, activating the proliferation of endoplasmic reticulum stressed cells. So we are testing this molecule for the regeneration of retinal ganglion cells and the insulin producing cells. So these are all ongoing. I will skip these in our lab. So this is our, these are our pipelines for developing uh, treatments for Wolfram syndrome. So uh, if uh, you are more interested in uh, these new treatments or any clinical studies related to Wolfram syndrome, uh, please visit our website at wolframsyndrome.wustl.edu. And here are my research members, and I always acknowledge my uh, mentors, uh, especially uh, uh, my great mentor, Dr. Aldo Rossini. Actually, she's late Dr. 
Bernardo Rossini because he passed away uh, already several years ago. And uh, this is my family. This is my mom, who is a pediatrician who showed me how to uh, examine pediatric patients when I was still in high school. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so, so much. Uh, we so appreciate your presentation, Dr. Urano. And I wanted to, uh, as we see all the clapping, I love from our participants on seeing that, we would love for you to answer questions. Uh, we do have a couple of minutes. And so if you would like to put questions in the Q&A, uh, we're really open to that. Um, and certainly, um, Dr. Urano, if you have access to the Q&A, can you see the Q&A? Yes, I can. I can see great. the q um, Great, so if um, there are those that have questions, um, you may read them aloud, uh, and you may also uh, answer those questions while we have a few minutes. Um, do you see any questions at this time? No, I don't see any questions, but- uh, No you know, problem. If you... um, I would love for you to um, just, actually, if you could put within the Q&A and within the chat, again, um, how to contact your research coordinator. Um, so for any of those who are participating today in our, um, in our event, if uh, you have uh, patients that you have questions about, if you would like uh, potentially for your patients to be contacted, or you'd like to refer patients to us, not only for clinical support, but for our research uh, registry in Wolfram um, and other related diseases, um, Dr. Urano will put in the chat yes, uh, so how I to contact just got, his research coordinator. So I just got one question from uh, Great. actually suggestion. So uh, Wolfram syndrome is an autosomal recessive disorder. Mm -hmm. And so that means it's different from monogenic di uh, other forms of monogenic diabetes, such as GCK MOD or HNF1 A MOD. They have 50% chance of transmitting their uh, diabetes to their children. Wolfram is an autosomal recessive disorder. So, and Wolfram is also a spectrum of disorder. Some patients have mild form of Wolfram. So many of our female patients with Wolfram and some uh, male patients with Wolfram, they have healthy children because Wolfram is such a rare disease. So usually their spouses do not carry any uh, mutations in the WFS1. So that means their children become carriers, but they can have healthy children. So, so fitness of the disease is actually pretty high. So the so Wolfram patients can have children, although many of them have some uh, fertility issues. So they can have children. Yeah, that's a great uh, question. And also it's different from uh, GCK MODI or HNFM MODI because Wolfram is an autosomal recessive disorder. We have time for one more question if anyone has any other questions. If not, we oh. can certainly move forward to our next presenter. You. you see another question? No, I just- Oh, you're getting uh, some good feedback. Yes, I got nice feedback. Thank you. Um, just a, a fantastic presentation, Dr. Urano. We want to thank you again for your time today. Um, well, we will be moving on to our next speaker. Um, Dr. Rochelle Naylor has been with our metagenic diabetes team since her um, fellowship days. Um, Dr. Naylor is an assistant professor of um, medicine and pediatrics. She's a pediatric endocrinologist uh, who's been a vital and, and important member of our monogenic diabetes team. Uh, she specializes in the care of children and adolescents, not only with diabetes, um, but with growth um, and thyroid concerns and other issues related to puberty and adrenal disease. Um, Dr. Naylor is an uh, active researcher with our monogenic diabetes team, and she focuses on the care and treatment of monogenic diabetes, specifically MODI. Uh, MODI is uh, maturity onset diabetes of the young, and she's really looking uh, to determine the prevalence of MODI among various patient populations. Um, she is one of the lead researchers um, supporting our monogenic diabetes registry. And she's going to be speaking to us today 
um, about her role, certainly as a clinician as a re- and a researcher. Um, but I think what's valuable about her experience is that she is not only a researcher, but she's actively seeing patients in our clinic. Um, so we're thrilled and honored to have her here with us today. And she will be discussing managing um, the common forms of MODI. Um, thank you, Dr. Naylor, and take it away. Thank you um, very much for that kind introduction. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm going to be covering the common forms of MODI, um, which is GCK, HNF1 alpha, and HNF4 alpha. I do not have any disclosures. So my objectives today are to discuss monogenic diabetes as an exemplar of precision medicine, and you've heard some of this already, and then also to just briefly review the economic rationale for making a diagnosis of monogenic diabetes, while um, and then going on to review precision treatment for monogenic diabetes. So you've heard already about the precision medicine and diabetes from the American Diabetes Association and the European Association for the Study of Diabetes, which has a goal of helping people living with diabetes improve the quality of life by realizing the promise of precision medicine for diabetes. That is, again, giving the right treatment to the right person at the right time. And as shared before, right now we know that monogenic diabetes is one of few areas where this is actually already proven to be feasible and is practiced, although not always with fidelity. And so I'm gonna be focusing on this concept of precision medicine, specifically in MODI, the main form of monogenic diabetes. As previously described, this is autosomal dominant young onset diabetes. It is approximately 1% of all diabetes cases, but when you're looking at diagnoses under 30 years of age, it's three and a half to 4%. And it is due to highly penetrant mutations in genes that are very important to the function of the beta cell. Just like diabetes itself, monogenic diabetes is not one entity. There are many genetic causes, but for today's purposes, I will be focusing on the three um, most common forms of MODI. So how is MODI an exemplar of precision medicine? The idea behind precision medicine is that we get a precise diagnosis And that precise diagnosis informs the way that we treat the patient and it informs their overall management. The basis of precision diagnostics begins with epidemiologic evaluation. So you want to look at the patient in front of you and say, for diabetes, what is the most likely form of diabetes they have based on the prevalence for their age group, based on the prevalence for their presenting features? You look into all of the clinical features together and say, am I, should I be considering type one? Should I be considering type two? Should I be considering monogenic diabetes? And the answer to the above is yes, for all patients, because there's a lot of clinical overlap actually, but then you can go on to diagnostic testing. And that diagnostic testing includes incorporating known MODI biomarkers to help figure out who is likely to have MODI rather than type one or type two. And then you can use probability scores. And and the MODI calculator was already mentioned before as one way to get a a probability score of MODI. And finally, you get down to subclassification. And in the case of MODI, you you get an exact molecular diagnosis to base the subclassification on. When we think about MODI versus type one or type two, and specifically thinking about the forms of MODI that we are focusing on right now, We want to think about age as an important distinguishing factor. We know that MODI is typically going to come on in adolescence or young adulthood. Obviously, there are some exceptions to the rule, but the majority of cases will be young onset. Now, of course, this overlaps with the age that we see type 1 diabetes, and it overlaps even with the age that we see type 2 diabetes, because unfortunately, we are seeing this at younger and younger ages. But age is nevertheless a a helpful distinguishing feature, particularly when you start to get beyond the age of 30 or 35 years for diabetes onset. We also want to look at parental diabetes. It was mentioned before that we really don't expect parents um, to be affected very often in type 1 diabetes. It occurs, but it is infrequent, whereas it is common in type 2 diabetes. But often in type 2 diabetes, there's too many people who have diabetes, right? It doesn't look autosomal dominant. You've got 75, 90%. Um, And sometimes we have both parents affected and we can see sort of the type two risk factors. And and so sometimes this this, um, overabundance of diabetes in a a family can can sometimes argue against um, monogenic diabetes. With monogenic diabetes, we're expecting a pattern that fits that autosomal dominant inheritance pattern, right? So every person, um, every first three relative is going to have a 50% chance of being affected. Um, Sometimes we get, we, we have fluky events, right? You 
toss the coin up and you get head 10 times in a row, but usually they're the, the presence of affected and unaffected typically helps to point um, you toward monogenic diabetes. And in addition, we of course are expecting there to be absence of clear signs of insulin resistance and metabolic, resist and, and metabolic syndrome. Although as mentioned before, there are exceptions to this rule. It's really useful to incorporate biomarkers. And the most useful of these are the beta cell antibodies to distinguish people who have type one diabetes. Uh, C peptide levels um, reflecting endogenous insulin reduction beyond the honeymoon period is strong evidence against type one diabetes. And then the HSCRP levels are clinically available, although not that often used, but are, are helpful as a MODI biomarker and specifically are a marker of HNF1 alpha MODI that has HSCRP levels lower than any other form of monogenic diabetes, as well as any form of polygenic diabetes. And of course, the reason we go through this careful precision diagnostics is to then direct our therapy, which is for GCK MODI, no therapy, and is low dose of fine areas for HNF1 alpha and HNF4 alpha. This study and several others have already shown the utility of using this biomarker approach in order to make this diagnosis. And it is important to note that while you would need to test more people using this biomarker approach than say using the traditional MODI criteria or the MODI probability calculator, then you're not missing monogenic cases the way that the MODI calculator and certainly traditional MODI criteria can. So precision therapeutics in MODI, um, as I've mentioned already, when you make this diagnosis, it should change what you are doing unless the patient happens to already be on the right therapy. So for treatment, for GCK MODI, you don't need treatment outside of pregnancy. And not only that, you can really de-escalate care. And I'm going to talk about this in more detail, but people with GCK MODI don't experience the microvascular and macrovascular complications that we worry about with other monogenic and polygenic forms of diabetes. And so you really can decrease their medical surveillance um, and you take them off the medication and, and, and take away their exposure to adverse medication outcomes. For HNF1 alpha and HNF for alpha MODI, the first line therapy is low dose of areas. And so this decreases drug costs, particularly for someone who's misdiagnosed as type one diabetes. And often it comes with a decrease in their A1C, which then translates into a decrease in diabetes related complications. I want to make sure to highlight the point that precision medicine for monogenic diabetes is cost-effective. And specifically what I mean is the cost of the genetic testing ends up offset by the medical changes you make. I wanna emphasize two things there. One, because the cost of the genetic testing ends up being recovered and you save money over time because of the treatment change, insurance companies should cover this. And we are happy to partner with you to advocate for a patient getting genetic testing if the insurance company is saying no. And the second point is the cost effectiveness hinges on the precision medicine. So if you were gonna do the genetic testing, but then not act on it, we've, we failed to make a connection along the precision medicine line. The, our group has published three studies um, demonstrating the cost effectiveness of, mo of monogenic diabetes diagnosis, the genetic testing for it, um, followed by treatment change. This has been in neonatal diabetes. We had a study in an adult population that um, didn't quite reach cost effectiveness, but um, showed simple ways that you could increase the cost effectiveness of a, of a general genetic testing policy. And we had a study in a pediatric population, which I'll give a little more detail on that really shows the biomarker pathway is how we get the cost effectiveness for, for genetic testing in MODI. So just to give it a little bit of orientation, when we think about any time we're going to do a, a healthcare intervention, we want to think about is this cost-effective medicine? So we do this, um, we use cost-effectiveness analyses to estimate the ratio between the cost of a medical intervention and the benefits of receiving it to health. We measure cost in monetary units, and we measure the benefits in something known as quality adjusted life years. Um, I think most of us would agree that um, we don't want to just live forever. If we're in poor health, we want to live as long as we can in as good of a health condition as possible. And so that's what quality adjusted life years do. And then this, we express cost effectiveness as the ICER or the inter, um, incremental cost effectiveness ratio. And in the United States, we tend to say like, oh, a benchmark for something being cost effective is about 100,000 um, So in terms of adjust uh, the costs that we're willing to pay to improve quality adjusted life years. 
One last slide for orientation of the CEAs or cost effectiveness analyses is this cost effectiveness plane. Over here, we see um, the benefit. We want the health benefit to be going up. <laughs> and we also see the cost, which typically will go up for health benefit. And what we never want to do is have someone become less healthy and have to expend money it, it, decreasing their health, right? That is a policy that is dominated. What we do want is if we can actually save money and increase health at the same time, that is a policy that is dominant. It's very rare that we get dominant policies, but one example of this is vaccinations, for instance, the cost of the disease itself is much more costly than the, vac than, than the vaccine. So we have a dominant policy where we improve health and save money. It's a rare feat to do, but we also accomplish it in testing for neonatal diabetes and monogenic diabetes, as long as we use, again, that biomarker pathway. And so in this study that was published in 2019, where we looked at taking, again, a pediatric population with GCK, 1-alpha or 4-alpha, and changing them over to the appropriate therapy, that would be no therapy for GCK, and so finding is for 1-alpha and 4-alpha, we see that over time, when we look when we, when we look over a 30 year horizon, that this poly is dominant. We save money, recoup all the money of the genetic testing, even for the people who were ultimately negative by changing over the therapy for the people affected. So it is cost effective and so should be pursued for the right patient. So now what is precision medicine? We'll start looking at one alpha and four alpha, and I'll just give a few more background words about each of the, the, the types before discussing why sulfonylurea is our precision therapy. So HNF1 alpha Modi is the most common form of Modi worldwide. It is the second most common that we see in our, in our registry um, at the University of Chicago. And then we often talk about HNF1 alpha and 4 alpha together because they share a lot of similarity, particularly in their response to precision therapeutics. But HNF4 alpha is much less common, representing about 5% of all Modi, and it's the third most common cause of Modi. Both are characterized by a progressive defect in glucose-dependent insulin secretion, and so you get this young onset diabetes, and like polygenic forms of diabetes, they are at risk for microvascular and macrovascular complications tied to glycemic control. Some particular, particular features of HNF1 alpha Modi include this low renal glucose threshold. So you will have people spilling glucose in their urine, even at blood sugar levels we wouldn't normally expect. And so sometimes this is how people first come to attention. They get a urinalysis for some other reason, um, and then people pick up glucose there. They check their blood sugar. They're not particularly impressive, but nevertheless, the glucosuria is persistent. When if you evaluate people with HNF1 alpha using an oral glucose tolerance test, you typically will see a very large increment between the fasting levels and the two hour levels, such that someone can have normal fasting blood sugars, and yet you can find that they, are, they have prediabetes on the oral glucose tolerance test. And that is again, because there is an insulin secretory defect as the primary problem. And then I've mentioned already that HSCRP, although not routinely obtained, is a useful biomarker specifically for HNF1 alpha Modi related to um, some of the regulatory roles of this transcription factor around HSCRP. One important thing to point out with HNF1 alpha Modi is that people usually, if you look at their lipid profile, they have certainly normal HDL levels and sometimes even higher HDL levels that we would normally say, oh, that's great, that's cardioprotective. But there has been research that demonstrates that their overall cardiovascular and mortality risk is higher than their unaffected um, um, relatives. And we think that this is probably something to do with the subfractions of, of the cholesterol or something else, but something that seems to be specific to the HNF1 alpha um, um, gene uh, pathogenic variant itself. And so one thing that we uh, recommend is that these patients, despite kind of having that cardioprotective lipid profile, are placed on statin therapy um, when they are 40 years of age or older, as long as they don't have any um, you know, contraindications to that therapy. For agent of 4-alpha Modi, there's also a couple of features that are mostly unique to it. And one is the common pre presence of fetal macrosomia that is on the basis of transient neonatal hyperinsulinemia, which will of course result in hypoglycemia. So these babies are often large and they will have this, this issue of hypoglycemia. Sometimes it escapes medical attention. Other times they have to be placed on diazoxide as a therapy. 
And at some point this resolves, there is a period of euglycemia, although it is very likely that they have some dysregulation of blood sugars that are subclinical and missed unless you carefully assess. And then eventually they have diabetes presentation in adolescence or early adulthood. This picture of hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia can occur in HNF1 alpha modi, but it is much, much, much less common. And so we don't think of it so much as a feature of HNF1 alpha modi, but it's a very helpful feature in HNF4 alpha modi. And sometimes when we hear that in the family history, either of the proband in front of us or, or just their family members, it makes us think of HNF4 alpha a step higher than HNF1 alpha modi. There are some laboratory features that can distinguish HNF4 alpha modi, um, but they, they don't tend to add anything in terms of actually pursuing them to, to get to the, the decision to do the genetic testing. And then as I just said, sulfonylureas or the closely related molybdenides are precision therapy for both HNF1 alpha and HNF4 alpha. And it is because it bypasses a number of the defects that pathogenic variants in these genes cause. And so I'll remind you that the sulfonylureas and the molybdenides both bind at the same receptor. The molybdenides are just a little less potent and that's actually can be helpful because people with HNF1 alpha and 4 alpha are actually quite sensitive to sulfonylureas. So sometimes we'll ask people if they've been on sulfonylureas and they'll say, oh yeah, I failed that therapy, but they don't mean that they failed it because they didn't have adequate control. They mean they failed it because they were so hypoglycemic that they had to come off the therapy. So it's an important question to ask when you're trying to ascertain someone's history and build evidence for Modi. Um, typically when we transition people, you do have this um, uh, De decrement in the A1C. So studies have demonstrated decrements as um, much as 0.8 to 1.5%. Sometimes people don't have a decrement, but their control is stable coming off of insulin to a pill. And so that's definitely a win financially and a win in terms of their treatment burden. And again, we know that there, of course, is an important relationship between the level of control and the risk for microvascular and macrovascular complications. And a dedicated tertiary modi clinic has shown a much lower rate, uh, complication rate in people who have been treated and transitioned and treated appropriately with sulfonylureas compared to historical co cohorts. And a little bit more of this study, some data from here I wanna just share. And so this is showing that initial A1C of a cohort of people who had HNF1 alpha modi. And you see this follow-up A1C where people, uh, the overall A1C has moved down for people switched over to sulfonylureas. Areas. One of the things about the sulfonylureas is that the durability is not always absolute. So some people will, will be on sulfonylureas at diagnosis and just continue on them indefinitely, and other people will fail them after some time. And one of the main reasons that people seem to fail sulfonylureas is weight gain. So one thing that is very important is to counsel about healthy lifestyle and exercise, which of course is important for everybody, but is um, of even more importance to maintain the durability to sulfonylureas. Because people are so sensitive, we typically are starting with a quarter to a half a pill for treatment and then escalating as needed. There are protocols that are available. We are happy to share them with you. They are, they are um, published online as well that help with this transition because some people, you'll wanna think about how low to start based on how long they've had diabetes and based on also what their insulin regimen is. So there's some guide, guidelines for people who are completely insulin naive. There are guidelines for people who have been on insulin and have had diabetes for an extended duration. And so um, there's protocols to support that, but it's important to remember that typically people are quite sensitive. So you do not wanna go with your standard type two diabetes doses. Another important note is if you are getting up to type 2 diabetes and escalating beyond that, and that can be a sign of non-response. But I will say before um, giving up on sulfine areas, please reach out to us because I will say that with adolescents, um, certainly pubertal adolescents, that rule doesn't always stand. You kind of have to escalate, or at least I've, in my own practice, I've had to escalate kind, until I get a response and then I'm actually able to pull back to the lower doses I expect to use in sulfine areas excuse me, in HNF1 alpha modi um, with sulfonylureas. And I've already mentioned that the durability varies and weight seems to be really important for that. And again, because mucalidinides bind the same receptor and, and bypass the same defects from pathogenic variants but are less potent, it's a great alternative if you have started with a really small dose and still are having issues with hypoglycemia. 
a lot of the literature that we use in, in sulfonylureas for children and adolescents affected are all extrapolated from the adult literature. There have been some smaller reports of, of therapy in children. Um, and you'll be hearing from Dr. Silguero next, who, while she's going to be focusing on HNF1 beta, one of her um, really her focus is, is on addressing gaps in precision therapy. And, and she is working to have larger um, dedicated studies of precision therapy in, in children and adolescents to guide our overall management. And then lastly, I mentioned that sometimes people do fail sulfonylureas or start to um, not have adequate control with them. Let me not say fail, but start to, to have inadequate control. And so then you want to add some augmentative therapies or even think of alternative therapies. And there have been studies in both HNF1 alpha and 4 alpha demonstrating the, the efficacy of DPV4 inhibitors as um, a useful adjunct and of GLP-1 receptor agonists as either an adjunctive therapy and potentially useful as monotherapy, although it is important to remember that the um, bulk of evidence for precision therapeutics has been in sulfonylureas. Um, there is a plan to study, to continue studies of GLP-1 receptor agonists in both HNF1-alpha and HNF4-alpha MODI. And so you may, you, your, your patients, or if you are living with MODI, you may be hearing from, or not may, you will be hearing from us soon. All right. I'm gonna switch gears now and end in, in with precision medicine for GCK MODI. So gluco, GCK, um, the gene encodes the enzyme glucokinase and it is the first step in glucose metabolism. We can think of it as our glucose sensor. So if I eat something, glucokinase says to my beta cells, hey, the blood sugar is going, going up, you should secrete some insulin. For people who have one uh, heter heterozygous um, pathogenic variant in the GCK gene, the problem is that for them, their body doesn't send that signal until their blood sugars are higher. And so what this looks like is stable fasting hyperglycemia, and it also translates into a stable but elevated hemoglobin A1C. This A1C ranges from 5.6 to as much as 7.6 to 7.8%. And what this graph here is depicting is people with GCK mutations, they're shown here in this kind of bluish green color, and then their unaffected family members used as controls um, shown in this orange. And what you can see is essentially, this is a hemoglobin A1C along the side, this is age. And you can see that first off, both groups have that age-related deterioration in glycemia that we all experience, but these um, lines are pretty much superimposable with the difference of, of GCK being shifted up because of this genetic um, variant. The clinical presentation, um, in terms of detecting GCK mode, it is present at birth. This mild fasting um, uh, hyperglycemia is present at birth, but it's usually not detected until you have a reason to assess blood sugars um, in an otherwise usually healthy individual. So a lot of times this is an in incidental finding with unrelated labs, particularly in children. The other time that we, we find GCK is, is when we are routinely screening usually otherwise healthy women during pregnancy. And so this, this is the time that GCK MODI can be picked up. Um, and unfortunately, often the time that GCK MODI is frequently misdiagnosed as gestational diabetes. And Dr. Dickens will be talking about um, uh, managing, monogenic diabetes and di uh, managing monogenic diabetes in pregnancy later. I've talked about these laboratory features. Usually the fasting blood sugar is anywhere from 99 to 144 milligrams per deciliter. If you do OGTTs on these patients, there's usually a pretty small incremental change between the fasting and the two hour. And what I've seen very commonly is that the fasting and the two hour values are almost identical. And I've given you the range of the hemoglobin A1C. Important and a reassuring thing about GCK MODI is that the microvascular and macrovascular complications that we are concerned about really don't occur in this group. This is a study um, from the Exeter group showing GCK here. This is their unaffected family, and this is compared with type 2 diabetes. And what we have learned from this study is that the only significant complication we find is background retinopathy. At the time of this study, the average age of participants was 50 years, so 50 years of mild hyperglycemia, and that was the only complication that was different than the unaffected control population. So I've usually given them counsel of continue to get your eyes screen um, and keep small problems like background retinopathy small by intervening if needed. But the macrovascular complications and the other microvascular complications are not different from unaffected controls. 
And that means that precision medicine for GCK Modi is no medicine at all, with the exception of pregnancy, which again, Dr. Dickens will be addressing um, later this morning. And this, I'm just gonna end with two examples, um, just driving home this point that when you use therapy, you really are not affecting their glycemia. So in this study, you have a population of people initially misdiagnosed as different forms of diabetes, type one or type two, and then getting a correct molecular diagnosis of GCK Modi. You have the group here who was on oral and in the black bars are the group before diagnosis. These are the group that was on oral hypoglycemic agents. And this is the group that was on insulin. And then you see after they've been taken off of all of their medications, their follow-up hemoglobin A1C, and you see that there has been no change because using medication really doesn't alter this genetic set um, in this genetically um, increased set point. The only way you really can usually affect um, change is by giving really quite high doses of insulin. And even then it can be very difficult because GCK Modi also counter-regulates at a higher set point. So you kind of hit blood sugars of the eighties and you are inducing their counter-regulatory hormones and also making them feel pretty poorly. I'm gonna show one other example before ending. Um, and this is an in a one example. And of course we want cohort studies and larger studies to really support um, the evidence that GCK Modi doesn't need treatment. But I think the in a one studies is really what drives home the importance of making the correct diagnosis and giving precision therapy. So this is um, shared by one of the participants in our registry with permission. Um, and so I, I now, since, since um, um, this participant has provided this to it. I've provided this to us. I've used it in a lot of talks, but I think this really drives this point home. This participant was a thin, healthy male, um, exercised a lot, very health conscious, but was nevertheless diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, um, very diligent on an insulin pump, using a CGM and doing everything, and frustrated because actually it seemed like it didn't matter what he did. Um, it didn't really seem to change the blood sugars. And finally, um, he got the correct diagnosis of GCK Modi. And what you're seeing in red is his overall um, blood, blood sugar values on his CGM when he was on an insulin pump. And, and trying to be meticulous about its control and seeing the same thing when he was off of everything and still being healthy because we should all be healthy, but not on an insulin pump and not trying to change something that was again, genetically set and, and nearly impossible to change. And so these sort of freeing stories of people getting the right diagnosis and then the right therapy are really um, what, what really um, makes my involvement in the monogenic diabetes registry and in a typical diabetes research really rewarding. And so with that, I'm gonna end with my take home points. So right now, um, diabetes precision medicine is the holy grail for all forms, but monogenic diabetes is, is the only kind of in life example and, exemplar and it is an exemplar of diabetes precision medicine. I want to remind you that precision medicine and monogenic diabetes is cost effective. We have studies to support this. And so when you have an individual with high suspicion, you should pursue this genetic testing and we are happy to help. We have templates for prior authorization letters. Um, and, and a, a fairly good success rate in obtaining the clinical testing. You have to always consider monogenic diabetes a diagnosis or the first time that you are encountering a, encountering a patient because this absolutely is being missed in our clinics. Incorporate biomarkers for diabetes classification that will be very useful to identify who should have genetic testing and definitely confirm your clinical suspicion via genetic testing. Sometimes just jumping to a conclusion that it's monogenic diabetes without proving it can lead to adverse outcomes, and we've seen that in the registry. And then once you have confirmed that diagnosis, make sure you act on it by implementing precision therapeutics. That is sulfonylureas for HNF1-alpha Modi and HNF4-alpha Modi, and also a statin for people who don't have contraindications in HNF1-alpha Modi, and that is a de-escalation of care and a cessation of pharmacologic therapy outside of pregnancy. With that, I will thank you for your attention. I've posted my email there, as well as the monogenic diabetes um, email, which myself and everybody else in the, in the registry gets, and then a reminder of our registry website as well, which you can direct patients to if you suspect that they have monogenic forms of diabetes. Thank you very much. Dr. Naylor, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, we are uh, just thrilled uh, and honored to have you here and to have talked to us today about the work that you're doing. Um, lots and lots of applause. I love it. It's fun to see that popping up. Um, 
please go ahead and answer any questions in the in the Q and A section if they come up, uh, and we will continue to answer questions throughout this process. Um, I wanted to you know take a moment to let you know that again, if you have any questions throughout the day, please put them in the Q and A. They will be answered throughout the duration of the program. But I also want to. Um, Thank all of our speakers this morning. We have one more speaker before our break. Um, we're just uh, thrilled to have um, Dr. Maria Salguero Vermont um, presenting today, and she'll be talking about H and F one B. Um, we, you know, have so many programs and uh, folks who are really at the forefront of this work. And I think what's interesting about this is that we have been able to bring together some amazing. Um, folks today who can talk to you about their work. Um, Dector's going to talk to us today again about h and one And if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, so our, our last speaker before the break, uh, Dr. Uh, Salguero Bourbon. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Thank you. Yeah, you, uh, you pronounce it correctly. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. We see your slides. They look great. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So um, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to present uh, this CME activity on uh, Modi uh, Asian of Gambeda. So I have no, uh, I have nothing to disclose today. And our learning objectives are to review the role of the hepatocyte nuclear factor one beta in the human body, the phenotype of the patients with MODI due to this mutation. And we will also review the management and the prognosis and share some of our research on this topic. So HNF1 beta is a transcription factor involved in the development of multiple organs, uh, kidneys, liver, pancreas, bile ducts, um, lungs, thymus, and gut. And the figure on the right shows the multiple abnormalities that these patients can present with. So their mutations in hna one beta can cause congenital anomalies of the kidneys and the urinary tract, pancreas atrophy, diabetes, then we call hna one beta modi, uh, genital malformations, uh, renal magnesium wasting leading to hypomagnesemia, and also hyperuricemia. So HNF1 beta has a critical role in the development of the kidneys and the pancreas and in the morphogenesis and differentiation of primitive uh, pancreatic ductal cells. People with uh, HNF1 beta show a reduction in pancreatic volume and exocrine cell dysfunction. Asian of one beta associated disease was first described in 1997. And despite the subsequent identification of many affected patients, research questions still remain regarding its functional and pathological consequences. So the prevalence of Asian of one beta gene anomalies in the general population is unknown and is likely that many cases remain undetected owing to the variable phenotype and the frequency of the novo gene deletions. So I'm gonna um, talk a little bit about the 17Q12 uh, recurrent deletion syndrome. So HNF1 beta gene is located in chromosome 17 and many people with HNF1 beta modi have a change just within the HNF1 beta gene or a large part of the gene or you know the whole gene when the whole gene is missing. Some people have a larger section of the chromosome missing. So the 17Q12 recurrent deletion syndrome is characterized by variable combinations of the three following um, findings. So a structural or functional abnormal abnormality of the kidney and the urinary tract, uh, diabetes, the MODI, uh, and neurodevelopmental or neuropsychiatric uh, disorders. They can have developmental delay, intellectual disability, autism spectrum disorder, schizophrenia, anxiety, and bipolar disorder. In this publication, the authors determined that multi-cystic kidneys and the 
other structural and functional kidney anomalies occurring about 85 to 90% of the affected individuals. Uh, MODI uh, occurs in approximately 40% and some uh, degree of developmental delay or learning disability in approximately 50%. Um, MODI is, uh, Asian of Gambaina MODI is most often diagnosed uh, before age 25 years with a range of age of 10 to 50 years. So heterozygous mutations in the Asian of one beta uh, can explain less than 5% of the MODI cases. And diabetes is the second most common feature in the Asian of one beta mutation and is the most frequent extra, extra, extra renal feature. What uh, make us think about suspect of HNF1 beta mode in our patients. So um, negative antibody testing, persistently detectable C-peptide, and two or three generations of diabetes diagnosed at a young age. Um, particularly to HNF1 beta, the family history of renal cysts and the family history of structural problems of the uterus of kidneys should make us think or suspect of HNF1 beta in our patients. So diabetes typically follows renal disease, but they can occur also in isolation, and the mean age of diabetes diagnosis is 24 years. The, the cause of the diabetes is due to the beta cell dysfunction and insulin resistance, and uh, pancreatic hypoplasia leads to beta cell dysfunction, which in turn leads to decreased insulin secretion. There is also decreased insulin sensitivity to endogenous glucose production. However, peripheral insulin sensitivity Sensitivity is normal. Um, our patients with Asian of one beta uh, face the same barriers to um, get uh, be get diagnosed as uh, patients with uh, other Modi uh, or patients with Modi. So the barriers are identifying um, the patients um, because of you know the overlap between them and type one and type two, the limited understanding of clinical implications, the lack of physician recognition, the lack of um, patient knowledge, and also all the barriers for um, obtaining genetic testing. But there are also more barriers for this population, and is the fact that there is no clear genotype-phenotype correlation, then the mutation type is variable, um, that um, standard sequencing misses the diagnosis, because um, uh, about 50% of our uh, patients with HNF1 MODI are uh, cause the mutation by a large of whole gene deletions. And of also, then some mutations can occur spontaneously. So in that case, we don't have family history of the disease and also the variable presentation within a family. Some, some of them might present only with MODI, some renal cystic disease or other you know, renal disease. And, uh, but we should, um, we should have a high suspicion um, of Asian of one beta in our patients with renal disease. So in this slide, I just want to illustrate. Uh, then there is um, there is some reported differences between the presentation um, of, of these patients, uh, the ones who have mutations and the ones who have deletions, um, suggesting then the patients with deletions present earlier and also um, have more symptoms of diagnosis in the patients just with intragenic um, mutation. And then um, in terms of um, how important is a uh, genetic diagnosis of MODI, so um, it impacts treatment. It will um, also help us um, figuring out the clinical course of the patients, and it also um, make will help us um, with the surveillance of the complications and will help us identifying um, family members that are at risk of um, having this uh, disease. Um, how this um, genetic diagnosis can impact clinical management. So um, the majority of patients um, in the literature 
are using um, insulin or will require insulin treatment at the end. There are cases in the literature showing a response of sulfonylurea at the beginning. But again, I want to remind all of you that um, HNF1 beta MODI lacks precision therapeutics. And thus, um, thus uh, my goal is to advance precision therapeutics. And thus, the uh, University of Chicago is working hard on that. There are a few case reports on the use of SGLT2 inhibitors on uh, patients with um, hypomagnesemia and also um, the reported cases on the use of SGLP1 are A's on uh, patients with uh, HNF1 um, beta uh, MODI, but um, there is limited follow-up and then there are limited details on the diabetes management. And we hope to um, contribute to uh, uh, advancing precision therapeutics on these patients. And another of the implications of HNF1 beta, uh, the genetic diagnosis of HNF1 beta MODI, is that once these patients are diagnosed, we should uh, screen for renal disease, uh, neurological features, look for pancreatic exocrine dysfunction, and also look for uh, um, electrolyte abnormalities. This can impact um, the, the families and HNF1 beta genetic testing should be considered for all patients with developmental renal disease, particularly if renal cyst or hyperechogenic are detected or other extra renal clinical features are present. We got to remember that it's a 50% risk of transmission. So, um, and then we should screen not only for diabetes, but also for renal disease and for developmental delays. So the prognosis of HNF1 beta MODI after 20, uh, 10 to 20 years is what are available so far. It's suggested to, so far to be similar to um, the HNF1 alpha MODI and HNF1 um, and type 1 diabetes with regards to the prevalence of uh, retinopathy present about 27%, neuropathy in 40% of the cases, and microvascular complication in around 10% of the cases. On the other hand, renal impairment is much more prevalent in HNF1 beta MODI patients with 21% suffering from N-stage renal disease and 44% uh, from stages three and four uh, of chronic uh, kidney disease. And that's due to the major role uh, played by HNF1 beta in renal, renal development. So uh, under the mentorship of uh, Dr. Naylor and Dr. Philipson, I uh, closely analyzed the cohort of participants with pathogenic HNF1 beta mutation to inform an appropriate therapeutic approach. And I wanna show you these results right now. So this table shows details on the type of mutations and the participants' age, sex, and the age of HNF1 beta diagnosis. Our, our cohort is very similar to previous studies with 50% of the participants having intragenic mutations and 50% with gene deletions. And similar to other studies of HNF1 beta cohort, we did not find um, genotype or phenotype correlations. And uh, therefore, it is caused you know, by the loss of one allele and explained by haploinsufficiency. This feature, uh, this figure captures the multiple organs that are affected. Um, in this population, and on the x-axis, there are the participants, and on the y, the number of organs that are involved. And on the top of each bar, there is the current age of the patients. And uh, kidney disease is the most common uh, feature in HNF1 beta patients, but since this was a diabetes cohort, we see kidney as the second most common feature, and it was followed here by, the, by liver, then pancreatic, and then low magnesium. Hypomagnesemia in these patients can be uh, symptomatic and can require IV infusions. And um, here we are showing um, 19 patients um, because we included like one patient with the mutation who does not have diabetes, who has um liver disease. In terms of um, treatment, what we found our, in our cohort 
is that um, on the left, you can see then the, the, that graph shows the patients with multi-organ involvement. And we found a wide variation in um, drug classes, diabetes drug classes that are using this uh, group. And that it was a reflection of um, then there is no precision therapeutics in this population. The majority of patients uh, on the multi-organ involvement are using insulin, and we uh, you see it represented in gray. And some of them are using um, sulfonylureas that you see it represented in yellow. And um, um, that is uh, that is uh, um, that is that is surprising because, as I mentioned before, there is like no no strong evidence that uh, sulfonylureas really work on this population. But more importantly, uh, very few participants have tried like um, newer diabetic, diabetic agents that might benefit this population. And on the right, um, we only have a few uh, people on the diabetes only group. Um, these patients um, were uh, younger at diagnosis and uh, most, you see that all of them are using insulin. And uh, the use of uh, insulin, we don't think that is uh, necessarily means that their diabetes is more difficult to control. We think then that's um, a tribute to the younger age of the group where uh, many diabetes uh, treatments would uh, represent uh, off-label use. So um, as take home point, so HNF1 beta modi uh, frequently causes multi-organ disease. There is uh, an increase in complexity and the burden of care of these patients. It is very important to do um, um, accurate diagnosis because that can have several implications, not only in the patient, but also in their family members. And uh, currently HNF1 beta uh, lacks precision therapy. So as I mentioned before, our team is working on improving uh, precision therapeutics on this population. And we are also committed to understanding this mutation and helping patients with HNF1 beta modi. So please reach out to uh, Dr. Naylor or to me with any questions and what also enrolling patients for the studies. So feel free to share this information with your patients. It's an honor to introduce our next speaker. Um, Dr. Laura Dickens is an assistant professor of medicine. Uh, Dr. Dickens is the co-director of the Diabetes and Pregnancy Program, and she is uh, really focusing her clinical practice on diabetes in pregnancy and looking at women's health uh, throughout the lifespan as it results um, in uh, supportive care for diabetes. Um, today, she's going to discuss monogenic diabetes in pregnancy, which is an important topic uh, as many women in our registry are of childbearing age and want to learn more about their own needs regarding monogenic diabetes in pregnancy. Um, so Dr. Dickens, uh, thank you for joining us and please go ahead. Okay, thanks so much, Peggy, for that introduction. Can you just confirm that you can see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. All right. Um, so again, my name is um, Dr. Laura Dickens. I'm an adult endocrinologist here at the University of Chicago, and I'm very pleased to be talking to you today about monogenic diabetes and pregnancy. I have no financial relationships to disclose. However, I am going to be discussing the off-label use of sulfonylureas for treatment of monogenic diabetes. And first, I'm going to begin um, by stressing something you've heard a lot today about precision medicine. So um, I would suggest that managing monogenic diabetes in pregnancy is really a key example of practicing precision medicine. We're using our understanding of maternal and fetal genotypes to determine the optical medical therapy, or in some cases, to even determine that treatment is not needed, and ultimately using that to improve outcomes. So here's an outline for my talk today. Uh, we're first gonna start by discussing some general considerations about diabetes and pregnancy, and then talk more specifically about GCK MODI, HNF1 alpha and 4 alpha MODI, HNF1 beta MODI, and then KATP channel mutations. So I'll first begin with a general review about some key concepts related to diabetes and all forms of diabetes in pregnancy. So this slide just reviews the maternal and fetal complications associated with diabetes and pregnancy. 
We'll begin on the left with the fetal complications, which are listed here. So with pre-existing diabetes, hyperglycemia, and early pregnancy can increase the risk for miscarriage and congenital anomalies, particularly things like heart defects and brain and spinal cord abnormalities. In later pregnancy, hyperglycemia increases risk for accelerated fetal growth and associated delivery complications. There are also long-term consequences for offspring, which include higher rates of obesity and later type 2 diabetes. The right side of this slide lists um, maternal complications of diabetes in pregnancy, which can include risks for preeclampsia and need for cesarean birth. Um, there can also be worsening of retinopathy in pre-existing diabetes. And with GDM, there's an increased lifetime risk for type 2 diabetes. On a positive note, we do have good evidence that treatment of diabetes in pregnancy reduces the risk of these pregnancy complications, including the adverse neonatal outcomes, such as stillbirth, macrosomia, and shoulder dystocia. There are several core principles of diabetes management during pregnancy, which are outlined here. Again, here we're talking about all forms of diabetes in pregnancy. Um, the first is that glycemic targets are strict and we're aiming to achieve blood sugars as near normal as possible to the, reduce the risk of complications. This typically means fasting blood sugar less than 90 to 95 and two hour postprandial blood sugars less than 120. We need frequent self-monitoring of blood glucose to adjust diet and medications and assess control. Dietary modifications will often play an important role, particularly with pre-existing type 2 and gestational diabetes. Women in these cases are advised to moderate carb intake and limit their concentrated sweets. Physical activity and appropriate weight gain are additional key principles. Um, so in general with diabetes, if lifestyle measures are insufficient to achieve glycemic targets, then medications, primarily insulin, are indicated. From an obstetric perspective, there's additional testing that's recommended to evaluate for complications, um, such as congenital malformations or accelerated fetal growth. And there are protocols for assessing fetal well being, such as weekly biophysical profiles in the third trimester. So, here I've sort of outlined a one size fits all approach to diabetes in pregnancy. It's often applied for patients with monogenic diabetes, which may not be the optimal treatment. So, we'll now discuss some of those more specific considerations. I'm gonna start out with GCK Modi, and I, I'll tell you, I'll spend most of the time on this discussion since GK, GCK is the most common form of Modi, and we have most data in this area. So on this slide is an illustration of the pancreatic beta cell. You may have seen this, um, this familiar figure. So it shows key proteins identified in monogenic diabetes from a landmark paper by Dr. Fiennes, Bell, and Polanski over 20 years ago. You can see that glucose is transported into the beta cell by the GLUT2 transporter protein on the cell surface. Um, and once there, the glycolytic enzyme glucokinase catalyzes the formation of glucose 6-phosphate. By enabling this reaction, glucokinase functions as the glucose sensor of the pancreatic beta cell. GCK Modi, as we've heard today, is caused by heterozygous inactivating GCK gene mutations. Because of GCK's, GCK's key role as the glucose sensor of the pancreatic beta cell, these mutations cause fasting blood sugar to be elevated but regulated at this higher level. Inheritance is autosomal dominant and the prevalence is around 1 in 1,000. GCK, however, is often undiagnosed or misdiagnosed as type 1 or 2 or gestational diabetes. Patients affected by GCK have mild asymptomatic fasting hyperglycemia, fasting blood sugars generally ranging 98 to 145, with hemoglobin A1C between 5.6 and 7.6. This high blood sugar, as we've heard, is present at birth, rises slightly with age. The hyperglycemia is often incidentally noted on screening tests or even during pregnancy when it may be misdiagnosed as gestational diabetes, and the diagnosis is then confirmed with genetic testing. A key feature to understand about GCK Modi, what makes it the unicorn of Modi diagnoses is that treatment is typically unnecessary because complications of hyperglycemia do not occur, even with long-term mildly high blood sugars. We have studies showing that kidney dysfunction, neuropathy, and cardiovascular disease occur at low rates with GCK, similar to controls, and significantly lower rates than type 2 diabetes. Um, the literature has shown a slightly higher rate of background retinopathy. However, it's typically mild and not requiring treatment. Furthermore, we have studies showing that treating patients with GCK with glucose lowering therapy is often ineffective. So a large study from the UK looked at about 800 patients and found no difference in A1C between patients with GCK on treatment, including oral meds or insulin um, at the time of diagnosis compared to those on no medication. 
They then monitored patients after stopping treatment and again saw no significant change in A1C. So given this lack of complications and the limited efficacy of glucose-lowering therapy, treatment is not recommended with the potential exception of pregnancy. So in pregnancy, the outcomes and more specifically birth weight is going to depend on whether the baby inherits mother's GCK mutation. As we said, that's a 50-50 chance with this autosomal dominant condition. So if baby inherits the maternal GCK mutation, that mild maternal hyperglycemia is sensed to be normal. Baby's perfectly happy with that slightly higher set point. Thus growth is gonna proceed normally and birth weight will be normal. No treatment is needed to lower mother's blood sugar in this case. The baby does not inherit the GCK mutation, however. Baby's gonna sense those slightly high blood sugars to be abnormal. So then we will be at risk for fetal other overgrowth and those other associated complications that we worry about with gestational type one or type two diabetes. In this case, insulin treatment is recommended to lower blood sugar and hopefully avoid fetal overgrowth. So the graph on the right illustrates the observed difference in birth weight based on GCK mutation status. So keeping in mind what I just explained, the black bar that we see in the middle is the circumstance where both mother and baby have the GCK mutation, growth is normal. The median birth weight is gonna be in the 47th percentile. The white bar on the far left shows the circumstance where mother has the GCK mutation, but baby did not inherit it. So here we see that increased birth weight, the median um, birth weight percentile is 85th. And on average, those GCK unaffected fetuses are going to weigh about 700 grams or a pound and a half more than the affected fetuses. So based on this data and this physiologic understanding, it's recommended that pregnant women with GCK should only be treated with insulin if the fetus has not inherited the mutation and is therefore going to be at risk for fetal overgrowth. So how do we determine if the baby inherited the mutation or not so we can you know, move forward with this optimal treatment? Genetic testing of the fetus is not recommended unless indicated for other reasons because of the small risk for miscarriage from invasive testing like amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling. Instead, the recommendation is serial ultrasound monitoring of fetal growth to infer the fetal genotype based on those growth patterns. This figure illustrates that approach. Uh, so basically starting with growth scans around 26 weeks and if fetal abdominal circumference surpasses the 75th percentile, then insulin treatment should be initiated. These recommendations are based on expert opinion and studies with small numbers of subjects. So the question for us really remains, how effective is this strategy in practice for managing GCK in pregnancy? I'm gonna use um, some figures from recent studies to illustrate the challenges with these current management recommendations for GCK in pregnancy. And the first I'm gonna discuss is a recently published retrospective study from Ireland, which reported on glycemic data and pregnancy outcomes from 99 pregnancies in 34 women with GCK. So first we'll take a look at the glycemic data. And this really illustrates the difficulty in achieving the glycemic targets in pregnancy with GCK. So the graphs we have here show the reported self-monitoring of blood glucose values from pregnancies treated with insulin, and values are reported from the first trimester on the top and the third trimester on the bottom. All of these patients are treated with insulin, and you can see that even with insulin, the typical pregnancy targets of fasting less than 90 and one hour postprandial blood sugar less than 140 were not achieved in many cases. An important caveat to this is that in this study, only 10% of the pregnancies had a confirmed diagnosis of GCK at the time of pregnancy. So most of these women were managed as if they had type 1, type 2, or gestational diabetes. Therefore, it's likely that insulin was started in cases where maternal blood sugars were higher or if fetal overgrowth was already suspected. This obviously is going to skew the reported blood sugars and growth measurements, but still provides us you know, some, some striking evidence of the difficulty controlling blood sugars even with insulin and GCK. All right, and so the second point I wanna make is about the high rates of large for gestational age and C-section that are seen in those GCK unaffected offspring, those who do not inherit the mutation and even with insulin therapy. So the table we have here summarizes pregnancy outcomes from this case series. It's divided into pregnancies with GCK unaffected offspring, so babies that didn't inherit the mutation are on the left, and the babies that did inherit the mutation are on the right. I highlighted two rows in red to talk about in more detail. The first row is birth weight percentile, and particularly looking at the birth weight percentiles for those GCK unaffected uh, fetuses. 
So in this group, the average birth weight percentile was 69th without insulin treatment and 92nd with insulin treatment. Again, this is skewed because babies that were growing larger were probably more likely to have been prescribed insulin. And the difference was not statistically significant, but it does highlight Sounds like recording's back on, but um, what this really highlights is that the insulin was not effective at slowing the excess growth in babies that didn't inherit the mutation. The second row that I wanted to point out at the bottom is rates for C-section. So for GCK unaffected fetuses, C-section was common, 67% in those pregnancies without insulin and 82% in pregnancies with insulin amongst babies who did inherit the GCK mutation. So these are the ones that would have had normal growth and did not require any treatment. When they were treated with insulin, they had a significantly higher rate of C-section. So 73% underwent C-section compared to 11% of those non-insulin treated fetuses that did have the GCK mutation. So this, this is an interesting observation. It's likely related to the fact that insulin treated pregnancies are considered higher risk and thus more likely to be induced at earlier gestations, which can then lead to a higher risk of C-section. Okay, so in addition to concerns that we have about macrosomia in cases where the fetus does not inherit the mutation, there's some additional concern about growth, particularly lower birth weight or growth restriction in cases where the fetus does inherit the mutation but is still treated with insulin. So in other words, we're using insulin to lower blood sugar below the fetus's physiologic set point. And this is some data from a study we performed as a survey of women in the monogenic diabetes registry with known GCK. We surveyed 54 women and collected data about 128 pregnancies. Here we observe that in pregnancies where the baby did inherit the GCK mutation but insulin was used, there were lower birth weights and earlier gestational age of delivery. So again, suggesting an increased medical intervention in these pregnancies that likely didn't require it. We also had the troubling observation of frequent and severe hypoglycemia in pregnancies where women with GCK were treated with insulin. So this highlights a potential harm of insulin treatment, particularly in cases where it's not necessary. All right, so as these studies illustrate, you know, the strategy of using these second trimester ultrasound monitoring of fetal growth to guide therapy has its limitations. By the time we're seeing that accelerated fetal growth on ultrasound, it may be difficult to alter the course and slow fetal growth even when we use insulin. Furthermore, you know, some have advocated for use of insulin in all pregnancies, regardless of the fetal genotype, to see if we can get ahead of that growth pattern in the unaffected fetuses but there's concern that that may increase risk for small for gestational age in those affected fetuses, as well as risk for maternal hypoglycemia. So keeping in mind all of these challenges, there's been a lot of interest in investigating other strategies to determine fetal GCK status. So namely cell-free DNA testing. This technology isolates cell-free DNA of fetal origin within maternal circulation, which can then be tested for different genetic abnormalities like Down syndrome or chromos sex chromosomes, for example. The testing may be more or less difficult depending on the type of mutation. So new mutations and paternally inherited mutations are straightforward since there's not going to be overlap with maternal DNA. Maternally inherited mutations can be more difficult to diagnose due to the expected presence of those maternal mutations and circulation. Advances in cell-free DNA technology have allowed successful prenatal diagnosis of GCK, however. There was a study um, which, which is outlined here. So in the UK in 2020, they performed cell-free DNA testing on 38 pregnant women who either had GCK or HNF4 alpha MODI. And in 33 of the cases, the baby's MODI status was correctly determined. The ones where they couldn't make a determination, so those five cases, it's suggested that was because a follow-up sample was not available for additional testing. This analysis used droplet digital PCR to quantify the reference and variant alleles, and then based on the fetal fraction, performed a statistical analysis to determine the probability for fetal genotype, and again, was successful in a majority of cases. While this technology is still in the research phase, it's not yet widely available. The results have been replicated by other groups with similar success. So that proves the concept that prenatal diagnosis of GCK mutation status by cell-free DNA is going to be possible. It's a promising development in the field and hopefully will allow more targeted and successful therapy for these pregnancies with GCK in the future. All right, so next I wanna move on and talk about HNF1 alpha and HNF4 alpha. 
So we'll begin with a little bit of background on both of these conditions as a refresher from what you've heard this morning. HNF1 alpha is caused by mutations in hepatocyte nuclear factor 1 alpha, the transcription factor that regulates tissue specific expression of many different genes in the pancreatic islet cells and liver. HNF4 alpha, you guessed, caused by mutations in hepatocyte nuclear factor 4 alpha, which is an upstream regulator of HNF1 alpha. Clinically, the patients with HNF1 alpha will present in adolescence or early adulthood with hyperglycemia, characteristically a large rise in the two-hour glucose level on OGTT, and that lowered renal threshold for glucosuria due to the role of HNF1 alpha in the SGLT2 gene expression pathway. The clinical characteristics of HNF4 alpha are going to be similar to HNF1 alpha, so that includes the progressive defects in insulin secretion and presentation in early adolescence or adulthood, in adolescence or early adulthood, excuse me. Um, one additional feature of HNF4 alpha is that we can see large birth weight, macrosomia in about 50% of affected babies, which I'll talk a little more about, and they can also present with transient neonatal hypo, hypoglycemia due to fetal hyperinsulinism. In contrast, fetal hyperinsulinism is only rarely reported in patients with HNF1 alpha. As far as complications, so with um, HNF1 alpha and 4 alpha, these are generally related to glycemic control. A distinguishing feature of these two conditions is the sensitivity to treatment with low dose sulfonylureas. So those are recommended as first line therapy. A majority of patients that have previously been treated with insulin can be transitioned off insulin to sulfonylureas with equal or improved glycemic control. Those patients who aren't able to successfully transition off insulin tend to have longer duration of diabetes, whereby you can experience a progressive loss of beta cell function. All right, so here we'll talk a little bit more about the pregnancy outcome. So in pregnancies affected by HNF1 alpha, maternal glycemic control is really the key determinant of fetal outcomes. In most cases, um, we don't see a strong effect of fetal inheritance of the mutation on birth weight or incidence of hypoglycemia. So it really is all about mom's blood sugar control. There have been, as I said, rare case reports of congenital hyperinsulinism due to those HNF1 alpha genes. It's a different story with HNF4 alpha. So here the birth weight and outcomes are highly dependent upon the fetal genotype. It's not clear why this difference is observed, but fetuses with HNF4 alpha appear to have excess insulin secretion in utero and shortly after birth leading to that presentation of macrosomia and that risk for neonatal hypoglycemia. So offspring who do inherit that HNF4 alpha mutation have median increases in birth weight of about 800 grams compared to their unaffected family members. 76% of those HNF4 alpha mutation carriers, um, sorry, 56% will have macrosomia compared to 13% of unaffected family members. The rates for hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia is at about 15% for those HNF4 alpha mutation carriers. There also appears to be an additive effect of maternal hyperglycemia on rates of macrosomia. So the biggest babies are going to be seen um, in mothers who have the HNF4 alpha mutation and are um, carrying fetuses also affected by the 4 alpha mutation. This is comparing um, to patients with a, a paternally inherited mutation. So this figure on the right just um, goes into a little bit more detail about those birth weight differences. This is from a report of 108 subjects from 15 families affected by HNF4 alpha. So in this study, there were 54 subjects that had the HNF4 alpha mutation compared to unaffected um, family members. The birth weights reported in figure A are for all offspring. Uh, figure B is when the mutation was inherited from the father. Figure C is when the mutation was inherited from the mother. And figure D looks at siblings who are discordant for the HNF4 alpha mutation. So the, the writing's a little bit small, but in the graphs, NM are subjects that have the mutation. NN are subjects that are unaffected. So in all groups, you can see that um, the NM category on the left is associated with higher birth weight compared to family members without the mutation. You can also see in figure C that apparent additive effect of um, the fetus inheriting the mutation and the mom being affected by HNF4 alpha diabetes. All right, so now we've established a few sort of basic points that in HNF1 alpha and 4 alpha, birth weight is dependent on maternal glycemic control. And in the case of HNF4 alpha, the fetus is mutation status. Um, we've also reviewed that outside of pregnancy, sulfonylureas are going to be the optimal treatment for glycemic control. So now we can talk about treatment considerations during pregnancy. 
It may be the obvious solution to contingual sulfonylureas. However, in recent years, it's become increasingly recognized that sulfonylureas cross the placenta and can be problematic in pregnancy. So this is a figure from a meta-analysis in 2015, looking at rates of large for gestational age, comparing um, figure A is gliburide versus insulin, and figure C is metformin versus gliburide. So compared with both metformin and insulin, gliburide is more likely to result in large for gestational age infants. There's also additional data showing higher risk for neonatal hypoglycemia with sulfonylureas. So when we're treating HNF1 alpha and HNF4 alpha in pregnancy, we have to consider the risks of sulfonylurea therapy versus the risks of uncontrolled hyperglycemia, particularly when we're thinking about making therapy changes during pregnancy. Um, so the recommendations that I included here, this is from a 2017 paper from the Exeter Group um, reviewing management of sulfonylurea-treated monogenic diabetes in pregnancy. So you see HNF1 alpha and 4 alpha modi on the top, and the options that are presented begin pre-pregnancy when you can consider switching to insulin from sulfonylureas. There may be worsening glycemic control in this transition. So um, the idea is it's optimal to make this transition before pregnancy to avoid hyperglycemia during that critical early period of pregnancy and organogenesis. If a patient has continued on sulfonylureas in the first trimester, the recommendation is then to switch to insulin in the second trimester to avoid those risks for macrosomia and neonatal hypoglycemia. All right, so moving on, we're next gonna talk about pregnancy with HNF1 beta modi. This will be brief because the data here is really, is really slim. So um, just some background to begin with. HNF1 beta is caused by mutations in hepatocyte nuclear factor 1 beta, transcription factor expressed in embryonic development of the kidney, pancreas, liver, and GU tract. As we've heard, in addition to diabetes, HNF1 beta is associated with developmental renal disease. So typically, this is going to be cystic and not diabetes related. You can also see genital tract malformations, abnormal liver function. Um, when patients with HNF1 beta, um, they, they tend to have decreased insulin sensitivity compared to those with HNF1 alpha. Only rarely are sulfonylurea is going to be effective, so insulin is required for glycemic control in most cases. There's, as I said, very limited data about pregnancy outcomes with HNF1 beta. One small cohort study did demonstrate a significant impact of the maternal and fetal genotype on birth weight. So babies with the HNF1 beta mutation born to unaffected mothers had significantly reduced birth weight, actually 69% incidence of small for gestational age. Birth weight was seen to be increased in babies that did have the HNF1 beta mutation inherited from the mom. So in the case of um, baby being affected and then mom having diabetes as well. Um, the management recommendations are essentially just to continue with insulin and treat to the typical pregnancy targets. All right, so very last, we're going to talk about pregnancy with the KATP channel mutations. And this is another figure you may have seen. It's an illustration of the pancreatic beta cell showing the role of the ATP sensitive potassium channel in insulin secretion. So as we, as we reviewed earlier, glucose enters the beta cell through the GLUT2 transporter, and then the KATP channel closes. This leads to membrane depolarization, activation of voltage-gated calcium channels, leading in turn to an increase in intracellular calcium, which then triggers insulin secretion. Um, when we see mutations in this ATP-sensitive potassium channel, um, including activating mutations of KC and J11 and ABCC8. This is the most common reason um, for permanent neonatal diabetes. The mutations result in failure of KATP channel closure and thus insufficient beta cell secretion. As I said, patients present with permanent neonatal diabetes. There are also some associated neurologic abnormalities which have been described, which can include developmental delay and epilepsy. Sulfonylureas are a targeted treatment here. They cause KATP channel closure through an ATP independent mechanism and are effective treatments for a majority of patients with those KC and J11 and ABCC8 related diabetes. In contrast to the HNF1 alpha and 4 alpha patients, we're going to need high doses of sulfonylurea here to treat the patients with average doses of about 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per day. Okay, so talking about these channel mutations during pregnancy, the outcomes here, again, are gonna be dependent on fetal genotype. Patients that are affected, um, or fetuses that are affected with the mutation will generally have low birth weight due to the insulin secretory defect that's present in utero. 
Therefore, using sulfonylureas in this case may actually be beneficial for fetal growth and restoring insulin secretion, potentially also neurocognitive outcomes that we'll discuss in the next slide. However, for unaffected fetuses, um, we may have those familiar risks of sulfonylurea therapy, macrosomia, and neonatal hypoglycemia. So this is another circumstance where we're going to use ultrasound monitoring to infer the fetal genotype and thus guide our therapy. It's recommended to begin with serial growth ultrasound starting at 28 weeks. If there's reduced fetal growth, this would suggest the fetus has inherited the mutation and is having the consequences of that insulin secretory defect. In this case, we should use sulfonylureas. Um, we should continue them if the patient was already on it, or we should initiate them if the patient had been on insulin um, due to the potential improvement in birth weight and potentially cognitive outcomes. If you're seeing that fetal growth is normal or accelerated, consideration should be given to switching to insulin to reduce those third trimester risks for macrosomia and neonatal hypoglycemia that we see with sulfonylureas. The potential impact of sulfonylureas in utero has been posited by researchers, um, but this is again specifically talking about um, neurocognitive outcomes, based on some findings that early sulfonylurea treatment appears to impact neurodevelopmental income outcomes more strongly. So this may be due to treatment timing during critical windows of brain development. Multiple case series have reported improvements in motor function, cognition, communication, attention, and behavior with transition to sulfonylureas. So this really highlights the potential benefit of having patients on sulfonylureas in pregnancies where we think the fetus has inherited the mutation to begin that potential you know, improvement effect even in utero. All right, and, and here again, it's another circumstance where the use of cell-free DNA testing for confirming a prenatal diagnosis could play a significant role, particularly for identifying those affected fetuses that are really gonna benefit from continuing on sulfonylureas. I included here a case report. This is actually where cell-free DNA testing was used to test for the paternal and for a paternally inherited KCNJ11 mutation. They did successfully determine that the fetus had not inherited the mutation. So here, obviously, we're not talking about in utero growth as it's, um, uh, as we're, as it's a paternal um, mutation, so the therapeutic options would, would be limited. Um, but this was helpful in predicting the risk for neonatal diabetes. So sequencing for maternally inherited mutations, while probably more complicated, is going to offer the ability for more targeted therapy. So hopefully, we'll continue to see advances in this field. All right, and these are just the conclusions I wanted to end with, reiterating that managing monogenic diabetes in pregnancy is, is truly precision medicine where we're tailoring therapy to an individual's genetics. Maternal and fetal genotypes affect pregnancy outcomes with monogenic diabetes. The effect differs depending on the mutation. And lastly, I can't stress enough um, our hope that these non-invasive prenatal diagnosis techniques with cell-free DNA um, will help us have more targeted management strategies, particularly in the conditions of GCK and the K ATP channel mutations. All right, so I think I'm probably close to time. Thank you for your attention. Um, I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Fantastic, Dr. Dickens. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, we are at time. You did a fantastic job though, wrapping in 30 minutes. Um, for those of you who have questions, uh, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A. Dr. Dickens is happy to answer them. Lots of virtual applause. I love that. Um, thanks so much um, again, Dr. Dickens. Um, I wanted to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Siri Atma Greeley is an associate professor of both medicine and pediatrics at the University of Chicago. Um, Dr. Greeley, during his fellowship, um, a few years ago, uh, did some really fantastic work as a pediatric endocrine fellow um, studying um, monogenic diabetes early on with Dr. Philipson and Dr. Bell and others. Um, Dr. Greeley uh, has been with us all these years and we're so grateful that he has grown the monogenic diabetes registry with us and has also um, really made his life's work focusing on um, the clinical implications of monogenic and neonatal diabetes specifically um, on pediatric patients, families, um, and, and the community at large. Uh, he's done so much for this community and we're thrilled that he's able to be here today to speak to you about the most common monogenic causes of neonatal diabetes, KCNJ11, ABCC8, INS, and 6Q24. Thanks so much, Dr. Greeley, take it away. All right, um, thank you very much, uh, Peggy, and thank you everybody for joining us today. I hope, uh, I hope everyone can see my slides and can hear me okay. 
Um, I have quite a bit to talk about, so I'm going to just jump right into it. Um, let's see, if my slides will advance. I have uh, no significant uh, disclosures, uh, but I will be discussing the off label use of generic sulfonylureas. Um, and those are my objectives. Uh, I do like to just briefly show um, of some pictures of the many, many people who have been involved with uh, the work I'm going to be talking about today, as well as much of the other work others talked about. Um, we're really just a few of the representatives of a very large, wonderful group of people um, who have uh, been studying all these rare forms of monogenic diabetes. Now, uh, you've just heard uh, quite a bit of detail about MODI, um, which is, uh, as people have mentioned, not, is, is fairly rare, but is, um, but is more the more common subgrouping of monogenic diabetes. And what I'm gonna focus on is neonatal diabetes or congenital or infantile diabetes. Um, it's gone by a few different names. And uh, these forms of monogenic diabetes are significantly more rare. So they occur in about one in 100,000 births, um, but they are a lot easier to recognize um, uh, the significance of based purely on the age of diagnosis of diabetes. And in that regard, a diagnosis under six months of age has about an 85 to 90% chance of having a, an identifiable monogenic cause and we think um, at most likely up to about 95% have a monogenic cause, and we just may not have uh, discovered all of them yet. Um, and most, in most cases, the, the baby will be the first one in the family to have it, and so they will be de novo. But it turns out that the most common causes uh, can be inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion similar to Modi and I'll be focusing mostly on those types. Now, uh, as I mentioned, I have a lot to talk about because you can see that the, the gene causes for neonatal diabetes are actually quite a few more than, than even Modi, um, but it turns out that the vast majority of these are extremely rare and mostly recessive causes. Um, so I'll actually be focusing my talk just to speak about um, the essentially the four most common causes, which is really just three different um, phenotypes. Um, as uh, was in my title, and these are them. Um, KCNJ11 and ABCC8 actually go together and form the, the KTP channel that, that Dr. Dickens mentioned briefly. And then insulin gene mutations and 6Q24. 6Q24 is a little special. It's not exactly uh, a gene. It's a chromosomal locus uh, where um, imprinting occurs. And the genes there, when they are overexpressed, um, can cause transient neonatal diabetes. And testing for uh, this form of neonatal diabetes um, actually requires uh, something a little different than uh, traditional sequencing. And I think Dr. Galcaudio may cover this um, in her talk next. Um, but if you have any questions or ever have a baby with neonatal diabetes that you're doing testing on, uh, we would be happy to help you through that. So just to very briefly take you through some of the history, my, which relates to my personal history with this topic, um, going back to our first case with neonatal diabetes. And she was a young girl who was six years old at the time and was being treated as someone uh, with type 1 diabetes. And her diabetes looked um, indistinguishable from someone with type 1 diabetes. She was on multiple daily injections of insulin, had switched to a pump. Her family was doing an amazing job checking her constantly and achieving a very good A1C. She had a history of a couple hypoglycemic seizures. Um, but one day, she, her dad happened to interact with Lou Philipson, and they were talking about some recent discoveries, and it became clear that she had been diagnosed with diabetes at a month of age. So Lou worked with Graham Bell so that we could get her genetic testing done, and it turned out she had the R201C mutation in the gene KCNJ11. 
Um, and then, of course, next they called me. No, <laughs> they, at that time, I was just a fellow um, who happened to be on service. And uh, as Dr. Dickens implied this uh, or mentioned, this, this genetic uh, cause implied a completely different treatment for her, which we were able to initiate in our CRC. And the basis for the different treatment goes back to, these are actually from the, the same set of papers in New England Journal that Dr. Dickens referenced with these cartoons that kind of show, uh, give you an idea of the composition of the ATP sensitive potassium channel, uh, which has these two subunits, the KCNJ11 um, encodes the potassium pore in the middle. Um, that is, uh, as we mentioned, ATP sensitive and it's, uh, regulated by the surrounding uh, sulfonylurea subunit. Um, and it, with both of these, they, they set up a situation where when uh, glucose is metabolized and the ATP ADP ratio goes up, it binds to the channel and uh, the channel closes. And so um, the, the membrane uh, has been kept in a state to maintain hyperpolarization so that when this glucose rises and ATP binds, the channel sudden, uh, closes and you get a sudden depolarization, um, which leads to insulin secretion. Um, now, what happens when you have an activating mutation in either of these subunits is that they become insensitive to the effects, uh, to the binding of ATP and closure of the channel. And basically, no matter how much uh, the glucose level goes up, you, the channel can't close and you don't get insulin secretion. Uh, but this really pointed to uh, an, a new idea for treatment because it was known that our oldest class of diabetes drugs, the sulfonylureas, uh, bind uh, to this channel. And it turned out that they, they bind in a way that is independent of, the, of where the mutation is acting and, and, and affecting ATP binding. And so the sulfonylureas can close the channel successfully in the vast majority of these patients with these mutations, except for a very small fraction of the mutations that seem to be insensitive to sulfonylurea binding. And so getting back to our first patient, as I mentioned, we admitted her to the CRC um, and started tracking her blood sugars. And she was, as I mentioned, on the insulin pump uh, with a pretty high dose of insulin that's down here. You can see her basal and uh, bolus insulin approaching a unit per kilo per day and her blood sugar is kind of a typical range. Um, and then what we started doing was decreasing her insulin and started uh, giving her the sulfonylurea and you can see the glyburide doses down here of 0 0.2 uh, milligrams per kilogram per day, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and so on. And as we um, were increasing the sulfonylurea dose and decreasing the insulin, what initially happened is the blood sugar levels uh, went quite uh, high and uh, we got a little bit nervous since this was our first time, but then we were able to do C-peptides um, on day four and show that uh, whereas on the first day she had no detectable C-peptide at all, by the fourth day she had a pretty decent C-peptide, especially postprandially, and that um, emboldened us to continue uh, to the point where we were able to uh, decrease her insulin completely and take off her pump and continue on the sulfonylurea alone. Um, and so this experience now has been uh, repeated many, many times over. And most of the time now, we're just advising uh, clinicians like yourselves on how they can do that um, themselves locally. And what you can see here is a graph of the patients within our registry uh, with these forms, where before their transition to sulfonylureas, when they're insulin managed, you can see that their range of hemoglobin A1C levels is exactly what most of us will see in our clinic patients with type 1 diabetes. And that is to say that some people are managing to achieve excellent diabetes control, um, but it's not easy. And the vast majority are, are having a bit of a harder time. But within six months of starting the sulfonylurea, uh, essentially uh, everyone can achieve an excellent level of diabetes control 
as long as they're on a high enough dose of sulfonylurea. And the doses really are quite high and sometimes make people a little nervous, um, but this has been repeated and published enough times that we, that we know it's very effective and that it's also very safe. Um, so the same family of the, of the first patient um, has been very much involved and very supported with, with our group and with, with many of our, our families. And they, they did this amazing thing of uh, creating this uh, uh, film documentary of not just their experience, but kind of highlighting the experience of many of other of these patients, as well as uh, the story of the science behind it. And um, if any of you uh, haven't seen this before, I suggest you, you look it up. I think it's still available on um, Amazon Prime Video, um, or you can reach out to us, um, but uh, it's, a, it's a great story. Um, this is getting back to our registry, which really, um, after our initial experience uh, uh, it, uh, with some of the publicity we got, prompted uh, many people to be calling us, both uh, clinicians as well as patients themselves, so that now within our registry, we have um, several hundred patients with diabetes under a year of age, and we have well over 100 with the KCNG11, and when combining with the ABCC8 patients, we have approaching uh, 200 uh, individuals with these KATP channel mutations. And the second most common being the insulin mutation. So we have over 50. And then you see the 6Q24 there and others. Um, now, in comparison with the Modi, there's fewer. Um, but uh, with this number of patients, it, it really does help us to, to create, um, to glean you know, new insights on their treatment and their outcome. Um, one thing to emphasize is I mentioned uh, under six months being a special category for the likelihood of a genetic cause, but I do want to point out that within our registry, we have always taken anyone under a year of age or even slightly over. And we found that about um, a little over 10% within our registry uh, have uh, uh, a monogenic cause even when they're diagnosed after six months of age. Um, it is quite possible that we have um, a somewhat skewed representation within our registry, so it may not be that 10 to 15 percent of everyone diagnosed under a year will have a mutation, um, but we think it's a significant enough possibility that anyone under a year should receive genetic testing, and if you have a hard time getting it covered, please let us know and we'll be happy to help. So I thought I'd go back to thinking about the presentation of diabetes in a baby to just give you a sense of how not easy it is to diagnose uh, diabetes in a baby that can't really communicate with you very well about what, what's going on with them. But basically, invariably, uh, what uh, mostly the mothers will describe to us is that the baby's just not acting right, that there's something going on, they're more fussy, they're uncomfortable, they're not very consolable, they're crying all the time. But um, if any of you out there are pediatricians, you will know very well the two questions that we always ask um, new mothers or new parents when they're worried about their babies. We'll say, well, are they feeding okay? You know, whether formula or breastfeeding. And uh, with these babies, uh, the answer is yes, they're they're drinking, they're feeding all the time. It seems like they're, they're very hungry all the time. And then the second question is, are they making wet diapers? And, and the answer here again is, oh yeah, they're making tons of wet diapers. They have uh, ex, uh, like very good urine output. And um, for pediatricians, that tends to be uh, reassuring. But in these cases of babies with diabetes, it's unfortunately inappropriately reassuring. Um, and so that often leads to a delay in diagnosis. And, um, and unfortunately, the majority of babies with diabetes will prevent uh, with DKA. And I wanted to mention that here in a study uh, that we did some years ago by going back to the medical records of uh, people within our registry and finding that about two thirds of patients uh, with, uh, as, a, as a whole group um, present with DKA and when you take out some of the causes where it's less 
often um, you can see that uh, DKA is very, very common. For example, in the ones who we think have type one diabetes uh, between six and 12 months of age, uh, they have a very high risk of DKA, which is higher than um, most studies of uh, type one diabetes occurring later in life. So um, here is another case to consider and um, about what might be going on with their diabetes. And this is a 20 something year old who, who might present to your diabetes clinic saying they've had type one diabetes for many years and have kind of a, a typical A1C and may not have ever had their antibodies tested. And it turns out they, they have some skull struggles um, and no family history that is until um, this gentleman had a baby himself and his son uh, turned out to have neonatal diabetes at two weeks of age. And so if you ever have a patient who has that kind of family history, you should really uh, take note of it because it's really critically important because it turns out that this dad himself um, has neonatal diabetes as well. And if you uh, actually ask instead of like he's had diabetes for many, many years and not really think about it. But it turns out he was also diagnosed as a baby and um, never received a genetic diagnosis and was always on insulin uh, forever. And uh, it only came up as a consideration for him because of his uh, son getting genetic testing and, and finding that he had a, a KCNJ11 mutation. And uh, as I mentioned, these mutations can be inherited autosomal dominantly, which was happening in this family. So the question for this uh, person who is now in his 20s and has always been treated with insulin for you know, 25 years, uh, would, he, would his cells actually still be able to respond to sulfonylurea medication if we tried switching them over? And the answer is yes, um, quite remarkably, even though he had only been on insulin and had not had very good diabetes control all that time, um, once we gave him enough uh, sulfonylurea, he started making insulin. It was a little bit uh, of a slower response, a little more sluggish, and he required somewhat higher doses. And in addition, we started him on uh, a DPP-4 inhibitor. And this is just mentioning uh, the issues with his uh, very mild uh, uh, difficulties with neurocognitive function. Um, and so uh, with uh, some experiences like this, it prompted us to go back and look at how the age at which a patient is started on sulfonylurea medications um, influences their outcome. And specifically, uh, what we were able to see is that the older you are when you switch from insulin to sulfonylurea, the higher the dose of sulfonylurea that you require. So in other words, it will still work, and it's kind of amazing that it works at all, um, but it's perhaps not surprising that it doesn't work quite as well um, when you start when you're older. Um, and we also could see here that um, most of the patients who were uh, older will require additional medications, which are not necessarily insulin. Um, DPP-4 inhibitors have been helpful, um, as well as GLP-1 receptor analogs and even SGLT inhibitors. Um, and if you have patients like this, we'd be happy to, to talk to you about it. Um, we did a study of insulin secretion. I don't really have time to go through this uh, um, thoroughly, um, but that just to show the probably highlighting here, the difference between controls and our patients with these mutations is that the controls have much more robust and, and brisk insulin secretion, um, but the, the patients with these mutations do make uh, what turns out to be a very similar amount of insulin, but uh, it's a little bit more sluggish and slower to uh, be secreted. And as a consequence, these patients uh, will have uh, higher blood sugar levels right after eating. The Exeter group um, did a, a similar study that is really uh, helpful and interesting. And they compared the insulin and glucose responses um, in these patients, uh, when they were eating a pure carbohydrate meal versus a protein fat meal with essentially zero carbohydrates. And I just want to focus here again, they showed something similar to what we saw where the insulin secretion wasn't as brisk, but was decent. 
um, over the course of the testing. Um, and the glucose levels go kind of high with the carbohydrates, but then they come down. Um, whereas if these patients don't eat any carbohydrates, um, there's nothing that really raises the blood sugar. Um, and in fact, they still get the same insulin secretion in response to the protein and fat, and the blood sugar can actually go down a little bit. The point here being that with these patients, you wanna be mindful of meal composition. And kind of the main take home point is that they should probably have at least a little carbohydrate with every meal um, to offset the insulin secretion that they're gonna have that is no longer mediated by the KTV channel um, which is the linker to blood sugars. And we did another survey study of, um, of the people within our registry about uh, hypoglycemia. And we're very encouraged to find that, that although uh, mild hypoglycemia occurs, and um, it looks like that occurs probably similarly to people without diabetes who are uh, you know, probably not infrequently going a little bit under 70, uh, mostly though the 60s or maybe high 50s. Um, serious uh, hypoglycemia in these patients is very rare. And uh, we did not have any clear episodes of severe hypoglycemia. In other words, no one had unconsciousness or seizures. Although having significant episodes that were concerning with a little bit of confusion and disorientation um, did happen occasionally, um, usually in the context of illness or um, high levels of activity. I just want to highlight here another study that is near completion with one of our recently graduated fellows um, who went back to ask if people were doing okay after many years of taking these sulfonylurea medications um, because the story kind of gets out there like, um, like their diabetes is fixed and everything is fine now and really easily. Um, and that, that turns out not to quite be the case, although when they take the sulfonylurea drugs, the, the vast majority will continue to do really well. It's not necessarily that easy to take um, up to eight to 10 pills up to two or three times a day. Um, it's really not an easy thing to do. And so many of these patients have had difficulties um, uh, for a variety of reasons, but including just the difficulty with sticking with the regimen, as well as potentially changes in their insulin secretion over time, although fortunately most people continue to do really well. Um, I'll just say a quick word on um, neurological difficulties in these patients, as Dr. Dickens uh, referred to, um, and there's a real spectrum in how bad the neurological struggles are that is very much directly tied to the severity of the mutation, where fortunately uh, the most severely affected uh, patients with uh, the most uh, strongly activating mutations are very rare and are less than, than 5% of people with these mutations, but they will have trouble even ever learning to speak or walk and will often have intractable seizures. Um, uh, what is a little bit more common is to have patients with uh, um, uh, somewhat severe mutations where they're, they have a global developmental, developmental delay that is pretty apparent from very early in life. Um, but they will make uh, lots of strides and, and, and uh, uh, go on their own uh, developmental trajectory and learn to do lots of things. And we'll end up with uh, a level of functioning that is similar to people with uh, Down syndrome. Um, and then uh, it, it, it goes on in terms of severity where there are other mutations that are also fairly common where they don't have obvious global developmental delay. But once they start uh, at school age, they will tend to have more difficulties, especially as school gets harder and harder. Um, and it's important to recognize that these patients um, could have these kinds of struggles. And even um, patients with mutations that um, in the early years were described as having only isolated diabetes um, turn out also to have at least a very mild impairment. And we were able to show this thanks to the participation of our, our many patient, uh, participants of the registry 
um, that they told us in, in those who had the mutations versus their siblings, they were much more likely to have a variety of difficulties um, with school, for example, as well as diagnosis of ADHD or behavior problems or sleep problems. And when we did a study using a specific neuropsychological testing um, in the participants versus their sibling controls, even the ones who were very highly functioning, what we found is while the, the controls were somewhat above average and their IQs were like an average of 110, um, the, the, the participants with the mutations, their uh, many of them, their IQ is actually in a normal range, um, but the, the group as a whole is shifted down and compared to their siblings. In other words, they have some degree of difficulty that is essentially within kind of a range of normal, but we think it is likely related to the channel functioning. Um, those uh, with all kinds of mutations tend to have um, more behavioral difficulties and, and other kinds of struggles as well. Um, so moving on to uh, quickly cover a little bit about some other forms of neonatal diabetes. Here is a case who is 19 years old, um, transitioning from a pediatric to an adult provider with kind of a typical diabetes control and a slightly overweight BMI. He's only ever been on insulin, never considered other medications, but interestingly never has had DKA and generally hasn't had ketones. And if you check his uh, antibodies, they'll be negative. And so this looks a lot like uh, a Modi kind of case um, as was described in the previous sessions. Um, and there's, but in his case, there's no family history, but there's a different kind of history, which is if, if you asked, and he might not necessarily have mentioned it unless you asked, um, it turned out that when he was a baby, he had high blood sugars for several weeks and actually required insulin treatment, but then it went away um, and his diabetes came back as an adolescent. Um, and so this is an example of uh, what, we, what we call transient neonatal diabetes, which tends to uh, be diagnosed at, in the most earliest ages, usually within the first few days of life. And these babies tend to be um, even smaller at birth than those of permanent neonatal diabetes for reasons we don't completely understand. But with having the concern about IUGR even while in utero, um, there's a lot more attention paid to them and they have blood sugars typically get checked very quickly and they get their diagnosis only to have the diabetes uh, go away on its own at a median of three months, but can be as long as about a year. Um, and after the diabetes goes away, then several years down the road, usually when they're um, in adolescence or young adulthood, the diabetes will come back. Um, we did uh, a study of a few of these patients who were now in the adolescent young adulthood phase to see what was their insulin secretion uh, like. And without going too much into it, they have pretty decent insulin secretion. And so uh, there's really no reason to treat these patients as type one diabetes. And this is yet another example of precision medicine where it turned out that, um, that these patients could be treated with other agents, uh, particularly GLP-1 receptor analogs, or uh, in some cases, sulfonylureas or DPP-4 inhibitors. Um, the vast majority seem able to be treated without um, insulin and to do quite well. So this is the last uh, type I'm gonna cover, and I know I'm pretty much uh, done with my time, but this was a really fascinating pedigree that presented to us um, early on with a, a three-generation family history of neonatal diabetes. And um, we were able to discover uh, the second most common gene cause of permanent neonatal diabetes was actually mutations in the insulin gene itself. And, um, uh, and we've now, as I mentioned, uh, found uh, we have uh, over 50 individuals within our registry. And there have been, uh, as you can see here, the black dots, many different mutations shown uh, to cause uh, diabetes. Um, kind of the, the very non-technical way to describe why this happens is that uh, the mutation 
causes the, the protein to be uh, kind of messed up and, and not folded correctly. So these are heterozygous mutations where the one um, abnormal protein, when it's uh, secreted, um, it causes trouble for cells and tends to essentially gum up the works, so to speak, um, and cause uh, uh, ER stress. So similar to what Dr. Urano was talking about earlier. And the more of this protein that the cells are making, the more toxic it becomes to the cells to where um, it appears that their beta cells eventually are dying off. And um, as they go along in life, if you watch C-peptide levels, they, they go dramatically lower. We were able to do this um, in the same pedigree. There was a, a new patient who was born right around that time who became uh, my patient. And then she had a sister and uh, her, the older sister struggled quite a bit um, with her diabetes control. Um, but we did kind of a case control experiment when her sister came along where we tried to be very aggressive about treatment from very early on and got her on a pump within uh, the first month of life. And we were able to show that by uh, suppressing the production of the toxic protein, um, we were able to uh, help her to have a, a better preservation of her C-peptide as time went along and her A1C levels uh, were also better. Um, all right, so this is my final slide. Just in summary, uh, uh, the main take home points are if you ever have anyone with diabetes as a baby, uh, please, please, please make sure they get genetic testing. And if you have any trouble, call us. Um, with KTP uh, mutations, they do really well with sulfonylureas, but it's important to give them the right dose. And with 6Q24, the diabetes will come back later in life. And with insulin gene mutations, aggressive insulin management is appropriate. We'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Green. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Lots of virtual applause, which I love seeing. Um, Dr. Greeley will be happy to answer any questions in the Q&A. Um, so please feel free to ask any questions uh, and we will move on to our uh, next speaker. Uh, Dr. Daniela Delgado is a PhD, uh, a professor of genetics and uh, is the uh, director of the molecular uh, testing lab and has done so much work with our team over the years looking at uh, genetic testing opportunities, genetic testing counseling, and thinking about research initiatives around genetic testing for monogenic diabetes, um, specifically regarding insurance approval and also how to help families. Um, so we are thrilled and honored to have today uh, from the University of Chicago to discuss, discuss genetic testing for monogenic diabetes and insurance approval. Uh, thank you so much, Doctor. Take it away. Sure. Thank you um, for the introduction and thanks for having me here today. Um, it's a pleasure to participate to this exciting forum. So um, I'll uh, go ahead with my presentation. These are my disclosures. So uh, you learned, uh, you know, all about this now. So you know that monogenic diabetes is a very rare form of diabetes that is caused by mutations in single genes. Um, the disease can be inherited uh, within uh, families or present as a spontaneous case due to a uh, de novo mutation. Diabetes can be found in isolation or can be a feature of a syndrome. The age of diagnosis can vary from birth to later in life, but from a genetic testing perspective, these uh, conditions are interesting because uh, compared to the most common type 1 and type 2 diabetes, um, for monogenic diabetes, we can uh, you know, identify the etiology, the genetic etiology by using genetic testing. Uh, you have learned about this already, but so you know that there are, you know, two main uh, clinical phenotypes of monogenic diabetes, neonatal diabetes, or so-called uh, congenital uh, diabetes and MODI. Uh, both of these broad phenotypes include syndromic diabetes that can manifest with extra pancreatic features in addition to diabetes. Now, in yeah. addition... Dr. Delgadio, I, pardon my interruption. I just wanted to see if you could change your view on your slides to presenter. We just see your notes right now. I'm so sorry. Just at the top, um, at the top there. Yeah, I had a presenter view. 
the slideshow view. You know, I actually don't need the notes. So how about I just present like this? Uh, can you see the screen now? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Um, so, um, so monogenic diabetes is not only um, uh, phenotypically heterogeneous, but is also very uh, genetically heterogeneous, meaning that, you know, there are a number of genes that have been implicated, described as to being causative of these conditions and are, you know, being identified as we speak. Um, so genetic testing for these forms of diabetes is available at a number of CAP and CLIA certified academic and commercial labs. And so as you know, genetic testing needs to be performed on a patient specimen that you know, most commonly is a blood sample or a saliva sample from which we isolate the DNA and then we can test that DNA for, you know, the presence of mutation. Now, the genetic heterogeneity of diabetes, uh, of course, is a challenge for uh, genetic testing because there are all these genes, right, that have been, you know, associated to uh, the different uh, uh, clinical subtypes. Um, but so back in the days, you know, up until I would say a few years ago, uh, genetic testing was uh, done only uh, looking at essentially a one gene at the time using Sanger sequencing. Uh, and, you know, this was a, a really lengthy and costly process. So the physician would order the most, you know, possible, I guess, gene um, uh, based on the patient's clinical presentation. Um, and, you know, sometimes we would test all these genes. It would take like years to complete testing one by one of all the genes and we might or might not identify a uh, mutation. But now that we, uh, you know, next generation sequencing methodologies have been fully established in uh, genetic testing laboratories, we are essentially able now to perform one test and uh, able to look at multiple genes uh, concurrently. So this testing can be performed in several ways, can be performed by uh, using phenotype driven targeted gene panels, which are gene panels that have been curated to essentially include uh, genes that are associated to a specific uh, you know, phenotypic condition. Um, uh, so in, in the context of monogenic diabetes, there could be uh, neonatal diabetes focus panel, MODI focus panel, or more large, you know, larger options, including all the known uh, monogenic diabetes uh, genes that have been described. Um, so that would be the, 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 you know, one option for testing. If you sort of want to pursue it, are interested in a more sort of genomic type of testing, uh, genetics laboratories now have implemented, fully implemented the clinical, clinical test for all exon sequencing or all genome sequencing that could be uh, good options to pursue in case a mutation is not identified in your patient, so for negative cases or conclusive cases. Um, so the clinical utility of doing next generation sequencing based testing for monogenic diabetes has been uh, demonstrated by several groups, by several studies, including our own group that has published our experience on testing uh, our own patients belonging to the monogenic diabetes registry at the University of Chicago. Um, uh, using a uh, targeted gene panel approach. Uh, the diagnostic yield of the test, of course, changes depending upon the methodology that you're using and the cohort of patients that you are selecting. In our case, our diagnostic yield on the patients belonging to the registry was of approximately 25%. This slide essentially shows the different uh, the different NGS based testing that are available uh, in clinical laboratories, starting with uh, targeted gene panels. So the targeted gene panels are essentially designed to look at a specific number of gene, which is a regular regularly a small subset of genes which have been demonstrated to be clinically associated with, in this case, monogenic diabetes. And because we look at, at 
a relatively small number of genes, the sequencing coverage of targeted gene panel tends to be really high. And because of that reason, the sensitivity of these assays is very high, especially for uh, mutations that might be present maybe in mosaic states um, or, um, yes, uh, mut mutations in mosaic states uh, and also copy number variations can be uh, reliably reliably detected by using on this on these targeted panels these are associated generally with a rapid turnaround time and um, and a, a relatively contained i would say cost the uh, next step up would be using a whole exome sequencing so the whole exome now looks at sequencing all the uh, uh, known uh, protein coding genes, so about 22,000 genes, and we are only sequencing the, 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 the regions of the genes that, encode, of course, are coding, so the exons. But because of the real estate for sequencing now is much larger, the overall coverage of exon sequencing is decreased compared to the targeted panel, which means that by using this methodology, you are looking at more genes, but you miss a little bit uh, in the sensitivity of the assay. And also the turnaround time might be a bit uh, longer. And the cost is uh, definitely higher than a targeted panel. The third um, option, which is really now in clinical laboratories, probably only available in a handful of clinical labs, is genome sequencing. So with this, you're sequencing the whole genome, so huge real estate. So then that, which of course result in now your sequencing coverage being much lower. So with you know lower sensitivity but the advantage of that is that now you are including regions that you were not including in the previous testing so non-coding region promoted regions enhanced regions that maybe my harbor you know my 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 identify a mutation that was missed by the previous methodology so this is an advantageous method to consider in case of you know you are really you know, trying to determine the cause of diabetes in a patient or in a family, and all the previous testing have been uh, non-diagnostic. So the clinical benefits you have already learned, of course, of doing a genetic, yeah, obtaining a genetic diagnosis is that you are now providing uh, the patient with an answer that can significantly affect their treatment. Uh, we can, knowing the genetic etiology allows us to predict a better predict the clinical course of the disease and explain other associated features. And I like to, um, in this context, show the example of uh, uh, the renal system diabetes syndrome, which is a multi-system disorder that is caused by mutations in an HNF1 beta gene. These patients tend to have a number of, uh, a number of uh, uh, clinical features, mainly uh, developmental kidney disease and kidney cysts. And in some of these patients, diabetes might present at a later, uh, sort of a, a bit of a later onset compared to the renal issues. So um, diabetes actually could manifest as a new onset uh, diabetes after, after transplant, uh, kidney transplant, in some of these patients. So analysis of the HNF1 beta should be considered among individuals with unexplained developmental disease of the kidney uh, that are undergoing kidney transplant to improve post-transplantation management. And also, uh, it's important to understand what the etiology of diabetes is to uh, manage them uh, more appropriately. The importance of really diagnosing, like making a genetic diagnosis for monogenic diabetes is also important for the family member of a proband, because now you are essentially able to offer what we call cascade testing of family members. So you can test the additional family members that might present with diabetes or hyperglycemia to try to determine whether they're cause of diabetes is actually the, the same of what you found in the proband. However, given the increase the increasing prevalence of type 2 diabetes, the presence of diabetes in family members with monogenic diabetes cannot be assumed to be of the same etiology, although, of course, the probability is much higher. 
And now all cases detected this way will become index cases for risk notification of their own first and second degree relatives, maximizing the cost effectiveness of genetic testing and monogenic diabetes case identification. I also like to mention that targeted testing for a known familial mutation is a cheap and straightforward test that is offered mainly in all clinical laboratories. Now, another uh, like one issue, I guess, that is being uh, discussed a lot uh, in the context of, you know, uh, genetic testing for monogenic diabetes among uh, people like you that order testing for monogenic diabetes is the fact that uh, the reports that we issue, uh, the genetic testing reports, are not always straightforward to uh, sort of understand, right? The meaning of these reports is uh, often the language is a bit complicated to, to, to understand. Um, so you, you kind of have to know when you order genetic testing that the, the genetic laboratories are classifying the variants uh, in a way that it's sort of it's helpful to indicate whether we believe that a variant can be disease causing and how certain that assessment is. And to do that, we use a five point scale to assign pathogenicity from benign to pathogenic with intervening scores of likely benign, variant of uncertain significance, and likely pathogenic. So that means that in your report, you might likely find that associated to the variants, you will find this interpretation, uh, um, you know, terms likely benign and a variant of unknown significance and so forth. Now, another thing to consider, if you are uh, now thinking of ordering a, a genomic test, not a targeted panel, but moving on to the next steps, like whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing, these tests can generate results that, yes, are related to your patient's phenotype, which is called, are called primary findings, but they can also, the laboratories are also reporting out what we call secondary or incidental finding, which are results that are medically meaningful, but unrelated to the reasons of the primary reason for testing. Um, and the labs vary in how these choices are characterized and structured. And also at this time, there is a pretty wide variability among genomic laboratories in the structure of their reports. And there are um, some efforts out there to try to actually standardize uh, reports um, so that they, you know, tend to look more similar among, you know, the different labs. I think the only uh, point that I really want to stress here is that if you are ordering, if you order a test and receive a report that maybe has some information that are hard to understand, I think it would be really important for you to actually reach out to experts in the field of monogenic diabetes and discussing the results with, uh, you know, especially to kind of understand what these results mean prior to discussing the results with the patient and particularly before making any changes to their diabetes management. Of course, as any test, uh, there are limitations to genetic test. So one thing you need to, to know is that a negative test report does not exclude the possibility that there is an underlying genetic disease that we didn't identify, either because the gene was not included in the panel that you order or because maybe their region was not covered by, by, by our assay or because of the sensitivity, intrinsic sensitivity of the assay that you are um, ordering. Well, another point to keep in mind is that there might be variants of uncertain significance that are reported today as such, but their uh, significance might be better understood over time. And so they might be then reclassified to either likely pathogenic or likely benign. So it would be it would be important for you also to, when choosing a specific lab, to essentially understand what is their policy for uh, reclassifications of variants. Now, I was asked to also include some information regarding billing for genetic testing. I am clearly not a biller, I am a laboratory director, so I can only give you information uh, from experience that I that I sort of witness on a daily basis uh, from patients that are tested in our laboratories and the issues that come up uh, with billing for these tests. So there are, uh, so uh, sort of broadly speaking, there are three uh, 
three ways that laboratories bill for genetic tests. One is institutional billing, so the uh, essentially uh, that's a direct billing from the client to um, you know the institution, uh, and, and this generally requires the client to establish an account with the genetic testing lab. The other uh, the other uh, um, uh, option is to do a, a direct bill to patients, so what we call self-pay. So there are some laboratories that are able to offer patients heavily discounted prices for genetic testing, which is particularly advantageous for people that don't have insurance or those with insurance that doesn't cover the, 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 the cost for those tests. And the last option is doing pursuing insurance billing, so trying to bill insurance for the testing that was provided. Now, the insurance uh, coverage for genetic testing really tends to vary greatly depending on the type of insurance and the disease or genetic test that is being ordered. So some tests tend to be easier, like more easily, I guess, covered than others. Uh, and generally, the coverage decisions are influenced by whether the test is diagnostic, predictive, or informational, and whether the test has both clinical validity and utility. The reason why often the insurance company might deny a uh, to cover for genetic testing is because they really don't understand what we do and they think that the test is really only experimental and not medically necessary and the reason why uh, they don't understand is because they don't understand essentially very much about genetic testing is because there isn't a really good system to explain for the laboratories to explain really what we are doing and the reason for that is that, like any other medical procedure, genetic testing are built according to a standardized system of, of CPT codes that are developed by the American Medical Association. CPT codes are assigned to a test based on its description. However, for genetic testing, there are fewer than 200 CPT codes for about like 70,000 genetic tests that exist you know, out there. So then you can understand that there are, of course, inconsistency in the allocation of how we laboratories allocate CPT codes for similar tests due to the lack of really specific codes for many tests. Um, and so there is really, this means that there is really no straightforward way to bill for many tests or for insurance companies to identify what type of genetic testing was actually given. Now, uh, the other issue with insurance billing is that if the insurance company does pay for the service that was provided, even in those cases, the payment rates uh, for, uh, for genetic testing are significantly lower than the actual cost of, of the genetic testing cost, and which means that some of the smaller laboratories are not really able to offer you know, insurance billing to the patients, especially to outside patients, maybe outside of the institutions where the laboratories you know, are located, uh, uh, essentially because we really cannot afford to lose you know, all, all this money on the, co on the, on the cost of the tests. Um, so one way to actually, when you're working, when you are deciding to bill insurance, to try the insurance billing, to minimize really financial loss, some laboratories require confirmation of coverage from the patient health insurance plan before the test is ordered, which means obtaining what's so called, it's what we call prior authorization for genetic tests before the testing is ordered. This can require significant time and effort by the, patient, by the patient or providers. But like I said, there are you know, commercial, larger commercial laboratories that do tend to facilitate this, this process for the providers. Um, so, and also in some instances where the patient's health insurance will not pay the total, the total balance, the total charge for the, for the test, there could be an outstanding charge that is now billed to the patient. Um, now, this amount can be really, really expensive depending on the cost of the test and the insurance reimbursement rate. So some commercial laboratories are actually able to cap the out-of-pocket cost that the patient is responsible for if the insurance company does not cover testing or if the patient have a high deductible. 
Um, so these are information. So, so the insurance company need, of course, a bunch of information to build, uh, to, to process the, the, you know, to, to, to process insurance billing. Uh, these are all the information, a lot of clinical information, uh, necess necessary prior authorization, clinical documents, including summary from genetic counseling appointment and so forth. And the requirements that are really needed by, you know, the different insurance company differ from, from company to company. So they're really not, there's not really a, a standard, uh, uh, you know, process that is followed by all of them. So it's important to just check with the patient's insurance company what they to require to uh, move forward with insurance billing. And the factors that influence the decisions for coverage depend, like again, on test type, the CPD codes that were used, and the clinical indications, uh, and whether you actually demo can demonstrate the effectiveness of the technology the type of insurance carrier and of course the you know the availability of a pre-authorization so in conclusion uh, you know I, we understood that you know incorporation of genetic genomic testing is really important into the care of patients into the care of diabetes patients diabetes is certainly monogenic diabetes uh, patients are certainly a great example of how you can really now uh, do precision medicine on these patients by knowing what the mutation, you know, the etiology of their diabetes is, you can adjust, you know, their treatment and you really see significantly improve their quality of life in some cases. However, there are a number of challenges that remains in insurance, in, in insurance that there is consistency and currency of payer policy for genetic tests. So that's re, really remain a big, uh, a big, um, big complication. And, you know, to facilitate coverage and reimbursement for genetic testing, they really need to update, update, you know, the list and include a bunch of more specific CPT codes that can be used for billing genetic testing and counseling services if necessary. And with this, I am uh, finishing here and I thank you for your attention and I can take any question. Lots of fantastic applause, uh, love, love to see that. Uh, Doctor, thank you so much for your presentation. Incredibly helpful. Um, we would love to um, answer any questions that you have. We are coming up on time at this point. Um, but if, if there are any questions in the Q&A, um, Dr. Delgadio will be happy to answer them. Uh, she can answer them within the body of the Q&A if anyone has any questions. Um, and I think at this point, we will be introducing our last and final speaker, uh, Dr. Lou Philipson, uh, who I introduced earlier today uh, needs no introduction. Uh, he is the uh, James C. Tyree Professor of Diabetes Research and Care at the University of Chicago. He is the director of the Kovler Diabetes Center. Uh, he was the former president of Medicine and Science for the American Diabetes Association, where he served proudly uh, from 2019 to 2020. Uh, he received the Banting Medal at the 2019 79th Scientific Sessions Meeting for the ADA for his work and his service. Uh, he really has pioneered um, the clinical management and study of monogenic diabetes and its implications for our patients with Drs. Bell, Greeley, Naylor, and many, many others who you heard from today. Um, Dr. Philipson will be um, sharing his um, presentation today with us, and this will be our final presentation of the day. Um, and we'll focus on the importance of making a diagnosis, uh, mitochondrial diabetes and personalized medicine. Um, thank you, Dr. Philipson, take it away. All right, well, let's make sure you can hear me. So that's the first thing. Yes. And now let's see if you can see the right slide. So are you seeing just the one slide? Yes. Looks yes. great, importance of making a diagnosis. Okay, great. So, so thank you very much. So I just want to thank again our, our, our wonderful audience. So uh, we had quite a few people listen, and now we're going to wrap up in the next uh, 25 minutes or so. I want to thank our wonderful speakers, um, especially Dr. Urano from the University of Vermont University in St. Louis, uh, and whose talk I think we can compare and contrast with the one I'm about to give. But I think overall today you've heard, you know, basically the 
the view at 30,000 feet from what we've been thinking about for the last um, 20, 25 years and how we're so proud of uh, all, all of our uh, all of our team in, in helping to get the word out and in helping to understand personalized medicine, precision diabetes medicine, and how these kinds of diabetes really explain the importance of making that uh, kind of uh, diagnosis and the implications of that diagnosis. So I have some disclosures here, some of our contracted research, mostly in type one diabetes. You can see that there. Um, some of the key points I wanted to make today in terms of, of this unusual entity of mitochondrial diabetes. So that is what I'm going to talk about. It's something that we usually don't cover as a separate uh, discussion point, but we are seeing more and more cases come through. And this is one of the most complicated kinds of diabetes that, that we see. So we thought we would spend a few minutes talking about this and how uh, the, our understanding of this kind of diabetes has evolved. So hopefully, by the time I finish, uh, you'll have some new insights into mitochondrial monogenic diabetes and, uh, and how to approach this, although therapeutic options are limited. So in, uh, in the general scheme of things, you've seen this slide now multiple times, but it's interesting that that while both type 1 and type 2 diabetes have been thought to have mitochondrial defects as part of the disease, and it could be both insulin secretion and insulin target tissues, and that is most of the cases, you'll see here that usually we don't even mention mitochondrial disease specifically in our usual introductions. And yet, when we think about the history of what we know about mitochondrial disease, uh, this is sort of the timeline where before 1987, Dr. Fiennes uh, and his colleagues at University of Michigan uh, were studying families with dominantly inherited diabetes, which then he coined the phrase Modi. Uh, but MILAS and related entities that are mitochondrial diseases, and you've heard, I think, already that this is mitochondrial encephalopathy with lactic acidosis and stroke like episodes, sort of the one of the hallmarks of mitochondrial. A disease that includes diabetes, was really identified before 1984, and the association with diabetes was clearly made by 1991. But it wasn't until a few years later, 1994, that this entity of mid mitochondrial diabetes, or it's actually maternally inherited diabetes and deafness, was identified as a subset of this entity. So how are these things related? And how do we think about them? That's what I'm going to discuss in the next few minutes. So this is a case. So this young man uh, came to our attention within the last couple of years. So he was 21 when he was diagnosed with diabetes and had in fact the usual polyuria, uh, weight loss, fatigue. Uh, he had um, lost some weight, but at the time he was still a BMI of 27, tall um, at 5'11". Uh, advancing deafness was part of his uh, presentation. And one of the things that I might come back to is that his deafness was uh, high frequency hearing loss. Now, one of the things with Dr. Urano's presentation about Wolfram syndrome and deafness, which are the other thing that now should, that, that should be the, the neuron that fires in your head when you think about diabetes and deafness. Is it Wolfram? Is it, is it mitochondrial? But it, or is it something altogether separate? But in this case, it's high frequency hearing loss. And oddly enough, in Wolfram's, it tends to be low frequency hearing loss, very unusual. So here, his blood sugar was elevated. He was tested for antibodies that are seen in type 1 diabetes. They were negative and was started on, interestingly, oral agents. We have this uh, metformin is always at the top of the list, although I'm one of those people who is not happy about that going forward. And he didn't feel well in metformin, which as you'll see is hardly surprising. And he was put on insulin. And he did well for a couple of years, although you know, this syndrome was still not well explained. And then we realized that there was much more of a family history. So he had a sister who had been diagnosed with type one diabetes. Both of her children had uh, complicated diabetes. And then when thinking about the whole family, we began to understand that his mother 
at age 56, had already had a kidney transplant for the specific entity of focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. She also had advancing deafness from a relatively young age. But on top of all of that, her diabetes was marked by extreme insulin resistance. She had been put on U500 insulin by an insulin pump, which was probably related to her severe progressive myopathy, which really had no treatment at all. And then looking further on, perhaps there were some hints that there were some other uh, family issues on her side of the family with, with diabetes, although not so obvious. And then even and uh, going back beforehand, not so much. So, so at some point, diabetes became uh, very prominent in this family. And with genetic testing, it became clear that the, everyone with diabetes had a mutation in a mitochondrial gene. And so this is the typical mutation we see in these diseases of uh, maternally inherited diabetes and deafness and MELOS both have exactly the same uh, mutation, which is a mutation in the mitochondrial genome exactly at position 3243, where an adenine is changed to a guanine. Now, there are multiple other, many, many other mitochondrial mutations, but this turns out to be a hot spot and has been associated with a variety of conditions, including, as we said, MELOS and MID, but we'll talk about the others. And interestingly, many of the other mitochondrial diseases, which are more typically seen by neurologists, so mitochondrial uh, diseases like myoclonic ep epilepsy associated with ragged red fibers, MRF, and progressive external ophthalmoplegia, Kern-Serre and Lay syndrome, typically seen by pediatric neurologists who don't really think about the diabetes part so much. So one of the things we've been trying to do is to set up a dialogue between those folks who see these complicated uh, neurological and muscular syndromes to understand also the relationship to diabetes and as you'll see by the end of the lecture, multiple other endocrine abnormalities. But since these are complex syndromes, involving many organs and in a variable sort of way, it can be very difficult to diagnose. And in fact, treatment is still lacking. So I'll mention some of these things going forward. This paper, which I'm showing, published in 2008 by the Exeter Group, uh, Rinky Murphy, the first author who's now in uh, New Zealand and, and uh, Sir Andrew Hattersley, really this is one of the best papers um, before the last couple of years on, on this uh, situation. Now, there are several newer papers that I'm going to review. So there's this no notion of mitochondrial diabetes with novel therapies. So this is one paper that came out a couple of years ago, and I'm going to uh, mention some of the points that they make uh, and whether we really have anything more than just a, some good ideas about what to do for these folks. So the idea. So why, why is this a problem? And what does the mutation do? So we think that this mutation in the mitochondrial genome decreases mitochondrial protein synthesis. Now on the right, I show the mitochondrial genome. So you may not be aware if you're not a mitochondriac uh, that the mitochondria have their own bit of DNA. So not much, but uh, at least eight genes in one direction and a few interesting genes in the other direction. And you can see there that there are pointed out some of the mutations that include some of the diseases I just mentioned, and with MILAS being shown here at position 3,243. But because of this one mutation that affects, in fact, the leucine tRNA, which is what is uh, dysfunctional here, so that means that all of the uh, proteins that would involve that tRNA, the transfer RNA, are potentially dysfunctional. So you have at the outset, and I'll show several slides related to mitochondrial uh, dysfunction, you have impaired mitochondrial energy function, which energy production, which has a host of thought of a thoughtful kind of out negative outcomes, including things like oxidative stress. There might be ER stress, which is related to what Dr. Urano spoke so beautifully about, and then decreased synthesis of certain amino acids, certain lipids, um, and related to that, then a whole bunch of issues related to microvasculature uh, and eventually multi-organ dysfunction. Now, one of the things we see on ultrastructure is very unhappy looking mitochondria. So you may, those of you who 
even have, have thought about looking at mitochondria in the electron microscope, usually there's a single beautiful membrane with multiple clear internal structure. And these guys look fairly terrible. They have multiple membranes and they're just not happy looking creatures. So what are some of the things that we've mentioned in our family that I showed at the very beginning, uh, kidney disease and hearing loss, but sadly, that's only some of the issues that we can see. There can be, as you can see here, a variety of things, short stature. I've seen families where the entire family had short stature and diabetes and a variety of other things, the sensorial neural deafness, stroke-like episodes. So these are very confusing pictures where it might look like the patient has a stroke, but in fact, there's no permanent damage and uh, it comes back early on. There's no... Um, no evidence of vascular disease. There can be a uh, macular pattern dystrophy in the eyes. And in fact, you see eye to, to retinal images on the bottom, uh, a, a, uh, an insightful ophthalmologist can actually make a diagnosis of mitochondrial disease just by the retinal exam. And we've had several patients refer to us that way. There can be heart failure. One of our patients had heart failure in pregnancy related to, um, to mitochondrial dysfunction. And I mentioned this peculiar entity. There are other things that can cause focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. But in this context of perhaps young onset diabetes in a non-obese individual, this alone can lead us to a diagnosis of mitochondrial disease. There can be a variety of other issues in the GI tract with motility problems. And I already mentioned the myopathy, we'll come back to that in a moment. So having said that, you know, how are you seeing this? Or are we seeing this? How often does it happen? And the problem is that um, we don't look for it. And if you're not really paying attention, you're not going to see it. And in some cases, it's non-progressive. And I'll mention that also as we go forward. In some, so some of the papers are looking at now incidents in clinics. So there's never been a systematic study of exactly how many folks in normal population have uh, these sorts of causes of diabetes. And even there's additional problem is that just detecting mutation is not enough because of something I'll show you on the next slide. But there are several papers from Japanese groups in particular that have been extremely interested in this problem. But in the particular combination of diabetes and deafness, where the deafness does not seem to be related to an infectious process, in some papers, papers, as many as 60% of the people seem to have mitochondrial mutations of the kind we're talking about. Now, I mentioned the variability, and there are multiple reasons for that. But in any discussion of mitochondrial disease, the key word here is heteroplasmy. So what is heteroplasmy? It means that we're all born with a certain number of mitochondria, and it's maternally inherited because that's where the mitochondria come from. While recent studies have shown that there are a few uh, mitochondria in sperm, the vast majority of our mitochondria come from mom. And what happens during early uh, embryogenesis, there is this uh, mitochondrial DNA bottleneck where as the cells divide from the initial, um, initial fertilized egg, basically, uh, there are some cells that don't get any uh, unhappy mitochondria and others that do. And so you have this really complicated uh, and to some extent random separation of sick mitochondria, where those that have wild type or normal mitochondria lead to tissues that are normal. There can be an occasional abnormal mitochondria. And then there are some that are uh, very sick and can, uh, can then, in some cases, the, there are no uh, healthy mitochondria in the cells at all. So this is a huge challenge when, uh, when counseling mothers here, because we don't know what the outcome will be in their, in their children, should they choose to have children and should they be healthy enough to have children. So at this point, in the, in, as I move along to from sort of older ideas to more current ideas, what do we do? Well, clearly, we need to have a comprehensive systematic evaluation of the patient. And there are only a few centers in the country that are thinking about mitochondrial disease or that may have a mitochondrial specialist. And as I said, usually they would be seen in a, uh, in a neurology department, usually pediatric neurology, because these are mostly kids that are the sickest. Uh, but occasionally we'll see and uh, people will be very involved in 
in cardiology programs or in rheumatology programs with the occasional endocrinologist. So we need to have all of these screenings. And it turns out that people can have many of the other features and not have diabetes. So it's recommended that there is screening if you have other mitochondrial disease for diabetes. And in fact, in one of my recent conversations with a pediatric neurologist, kids with other sorts of congenital uh, mitochondrial disease that do not involve diabetes often will have diabetes when they get to the point of needing tube feedings or other additional nutri nu nutritional supplements so that they're not able to uh, to deal with the the, uh, the the load of calories and, and, and carbohydrate that might be associated with that. So, so we have all of these issues that need to be sorted out. And I'll talk in several points in the next few minutes about possible therapies. But we know that there are certainly things to avoid. So this is, again, the, the critical example of precision medicine. You make a diagnosis of mitochondrial diabetes, and then one these are some of the things that fall out. There are certain antibiotics that are particularly toxic to mitochondria. And if they're sick in the beginning, they will make them sicker. So tetracyclines, and oh, we don't use chloramphenicol very much, but that was a particularly difficult one. You can see there anti-epileptic drugs can make mitochondria sicker. Uh, things that are reverse transcriptase inhibitors tend to also affect the mitochondrial uh, genetic processes. And we'll talk about metformin, but it's interesting to think about that the most significant complication of metformin that many of us never see is in fact lactic acidosis. And how does lactic acidosis happen? It happens because mitochondria cannot process lactate. So if, mitochondria, if metformin causes lactic acidosis, then it makes sense that metformin is inhibiting mitochondria, usually at very high doses, as might happen in liver and kidney disease, but here the mitochondria are already sick. So one of the things that I would say is never use metformin in mitochondrial disease, but interestingly, there are other opinions. So what are some possible therapies? Well, up until a few years ago, there weren't many. So CoQ10 or coenzyme Q10 is a small molecule that you can uh, buy in a health food store. And it's been advocated you know, to, uh, to improve muscle strength, mitochondrial health, uh, many times, um, muscle uh, muscle bodybuilders will use this stuff. There's, in, in what, what I can tell is, there's no evidence that it actually does anything useful. It's not obvious how it get how it would get um, into the mitochondria. It's not obvious at all how it would compensate for uh, for the genetic mutation in that particular tRNA. Uh, randomized, double-blind studies have not been done. Uh, people have also recommended thiamine. That seems reasonable to take some thiamine, but whether it does anything is not obvious. Now, for the kidney disease, it's interesting. Could one do kidney transplants in people who are otherwise sick with this? And the answer is it's been done. Uh, one of my patients is undergoing a kidney, tra kidney transplant right now. Um, so there, and there's a, a couple of papers in the literature. So it is possible, usually, as Dr. As we've heard from, I think from Dr. Dickens, in pregnancy, sometimes the diagnosis is made after the transplant. So the kidney transplant happens, and then it's found out that there is other organ involvement. And so it's sort of, well, maybe they should have made a diagnosis ahead of time. But fortunately, most of the patients have done well anyhow. So again, we, we've talked about cascade testing, the idea that Identifying one person means that the entire pedigree needs to be studied. And here, of course, it, 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 almost never do we see a de novo case. It's always the other family members need to be looked at very carefully. It can be very subtle. So it could be just hearing loss, or there could be some kidney disease, cardiomyopathy. Long-term follow-up is critical. And carriage in or carriage in maternal relatives should be assumed and should be looked for, right? So Dr. Del Guardio also told us that you don't, you don't determine uh, treatment based on the assumption, but the assumption leads you to genetic testing. And one of the issues here is because of this problem of heteroplasmy, sometimes blood or we sometimes use saliva to do genetic testing, that can be misleading here because, of, because the heteroplasmy suggests that in some um, 
in some patients, the, the blood or the urine may be a very poor choice for looking for damaged mitochondria. So what has been recommended is urine. So the idea is that eventually you pee out um, pieces of, of DNA, including bad mitochondrial DNA. So one of the ideas is to spin down the urine, look in the sediment for, for DNA using um, a variety of techniques. One can do PCR, one could do more uh, next generation techniques that Dr. Bilbao mentioned. And while most genetic testing companies don't do that, some of them will look at the percentage of DNA, which shows damaged mitochondria versus normal mitochondria in those, in those tests. So periodic assessments, clearly then neurological and neuro audiometric function uh, can at least give a sense of what supplemental or supportive therapy might be necessary. Now, very recently, several groups have, um, as I mentioned earlier, come up with some additional ideas of diagnosis and treatment algorithms. So here's one on the left, if you suspect mitochondrial disease. So that is interesting. If you don't think about it, you're not gonna diagnose it. You have to at least suspect it. And given the press, given the, the numbers, we're all seeing folks with these things in our clinic, you know, at least some of the time. So screening could be useful if in fact, uh, they're not already diagnosed with diabetes, but those who have diabetes can be looked at a variety of ways and then the idea is to do the, uh, the clinical testing. And that can be in a variety of ways. Now, this group recommends starting metformin if the GFR is reasonable. I would say no. I don't think using metformin in this situation is ever reasonable. And that's one of the critical discussions to have going forward. And of course, very hard to do the actual clinical testing to, uh, to see you know, at what, low, what, what dose do you do you hurt people who might have this, uh, this syndrome? So one of the other suggestions has been uh, for, for new therapies has been pyruvate. Now, pyruvate is an interesting small molecule that is critical for muscle metabolism as shown on the right here, but doesn't help insulin secreting cells. And it's very interesting that neither pyruvate nor lactate uh, get into insulin secreting cells, which is a very good thing because if you if it did, if you did have lactate getting into beta cells, then every time you ran and made some lactate, you would have insulin secretion. That's a really bad time for your blood sugar to go down. So somehow in, in this situation, uh, beta cells have lost the MCT. This is the uh, transporter for small molecules that includes pyruvate and lactate. So this stuff does not get into beta cells. It may help muscle, but it won't help insulin secreting cells. So part of, of uh, some of the newer approaches is this very interesting paper. I think I recommend it for folks who are thinking about mitochondrial disease. And this is a broader discussion in this paper, more than just um, the beta cell. It's also about other organs, as I'll show you in a moment. So this is, again, a bird's eye view, a cartoonish picture of a typical mitochondria. Some of these things are exciting areas of research today. You can see on the left, uh, for example, MFN2, that stands for a mitofusin. Those, there was just a paper this week on whether mitofusins are critical for insulin secretion in beta cells. The answer is yes. So you have to have uh, pathways that connect mitochondria to other mitochondria and to the ER. So, so this turns to be turns out to be a very cutting edge thinking and, and, and aspect of study for understanding how beta cells are regulated and make insulin. But you see the importance here. And if you do have right in the middle, it says mitochondrial DNA translation. And towards the right, you see uh, the mitochondrial DNA transcription. So this is where things are, uh, are, are dysfunctional in, in the diseases that I'm talking about. So the other um, endocrine manifestations are summarized on the right, and it is everything that you might imagine. So the typical systemic manifestations on the, on the far right here panel is what I've already spoken about with, with some additions. And then on the left of this graphical abstract are other things that we haven't spent much time talking about. You can have defective mitochondria in the parathyroid glands, in the adrenal glands, and even in the gonads. So you could have uh, 
infertility or pregnancy related complications that are also related to mitochondrial disease. So summing up really in these last few slides, the essential points are that uh, mitochondrial disease mostly causes diabetes. That's how they come to endocrinologists anyway, usually accompanied or often accompanied by sensor neural deafness, which is usually bilateral and always high frequency uh, hearing loss. There are other kinds of deletions. So I focused on the one, the M3243, but there can be other point mutations. There can be large scale deletions of lots of mitochondrial DNA, which usually presents with very severe childhood disease, one of the reasons why this is typically seen by pediatric um, neurologists. Um, and you can see there, there's also a, a disease of primary ovarian failure. Um, but it is critical that once we identify these folks, we understand we we well, they need to be studied and we understand how to refer them to other centers. Now you see on this diagnostic algorithm, this is now something that I think is, is something I do adhere to. Uh, anyone with diabetes less than 50 and you typically non-obese, although being obese does not protect you from the syndrome, if you're antibody negative, so then you go to the right, and, but, and then, you, then the differentiation is, do you have diabetes or do you have lots of other things? So if there's not too many things, although you've heard today that there can be quite a lot of other things in other monogenic diabetes syndromes, thinking about reeling that out first is critical. Now, some companies, and I'll come back to this in a minute, as Dr. Delguadio said, are including multiple genes in their panel. And now a few of them are including the mitochondrial genome also in the panel. And you have both mitochondrial genes, but also you have nuclear genes that can encode mitochondrial proteins. Usually those are more uh, spectacular presentations of mitochondrial disease. So this is one simplified thought process here of how to proceed. And then what do you do? So you know, is, is weight loss desirable? So that depends on how the particular subject started. If yes, we still think a GLP-1 agonist could be a good idea. I do not recommend SGLT2 inhibitors because insulin secretion defects could be a problem. And, um, and we worry a lot about euglycemic DKA in that situation. So adding other drugs and supporting other tissues would be one way to think about the management algorithm, but insulin probably is useful sooner rather than later. Are there other treatments? Well, there's a host of them. And as Dr. Um, Urano mentioned, even genetic therapy or gene therapy might one day be useful here. The problem is how do you get it to the cells that already damaged? So that is a very big issue, but you can see there's a law, a, 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 lots of groups of thinking here that involve first stimulating the good mitochondria to, to divide, to stabilize the mitochondrial membrane, to modulate the, um, the key proteins in the mitochondrial membranes. Uh, but at the end of the day, if we're gonna fix this, we, may, we, we probably need to figure out how to edit the mitochondria and deliver such editing tools uh, early on before too many, of the, too many of the mitochondria are defective and it does look progressive. So you've seen this picture or similar one several times through the talk, just to sort of put everything together. Uh, you see there the mitochondria in green, but nothing happens in, without a useful functional mitochondrial system. And there's, of course, not one, but a mitochondrial network. And they're very, very active creatures. They are uh, combining, talking, communicating with each other, with the, uh, with the nucleus of the cell, with the endoplasmic reticulum. It's an amazingly complex and dynamic system that we're still learning quite a lot about. And even having today's lecture discuss so many of these ideas, and you can see in some cases, we barely scratched the surface of what we're learning about in terms of, of these particular causes of diabetes, mitochondrial uh, defects, uh, combine all of these different ideas in interesting ways. So there are now a growing number of programs around the country. We're heartened to see that. Some of them are particularly interested in mitochondrial disease, but in many cases, they will be able to uh, direct you to the proper insight on testing. Um, 
And as again, as Dr. Devoadio mentioned, a growing number of companies that are doing genetic testing, both companies and universities. And where, what did we do this, this whole morning? Well, if nothing else, I hope you take a ca careful family history. But this is uh, the, the poster child, as we said many times, for uh, precision medicine. And yet, if you think about all the folks in the world who have one of these entities, we've been only successful in diagnosing somewhere between 5 and 10%, I would say. Our goals are continue to identify new cases, to have education of both clinicians and people with some of these entities to understand what it means to return genetic results. Oftentimes we return results and nothing happens because of inertia and a, a lack of understanding about what the implications might be. So these are some of the things we're doing. I wanna thank uh, all of our many collaborators locally and around the world, especially Sir Andrew Hattersley and Dame Fran Ashcroft who both won uh, wonderful prizes this year from uh, Andrew from the Harold Hamm uh, Diabetes Center in Oklahoma, Fran from the American Diabetes Association, uh, so many of other people uh, who've passed away who've been our teachers, uh, Susumu Seno and Don Steiner in particular, and our many funding sources. So with that, we thank our participants, and I see I'm two minutes over, so thank you very much for uh, indulging me today, and I hope it was useful for you, and we hope to be able to answer your questions.